everyone, and welcome back. So good to see you. Welcome to At the Table, the only show that asks you to pull up your chairs, get out your TTRPG books, and join us at the table. Today, uh, if you can't tell, we have a very special guest. Uh, it is a dog. <laughs> Say hello, Hama. Say hello, Hama. Hama, Hama, Hama. Hey, Hama. Hama. <laughs> Hama. <laughs> All right. But more than, yeah, I was going to say, more than dog, we have, we have an even greater special guest with us today. Please, if you could introduce yourself, uh, Eunice, back to the At The Table uh, group. Hey, there, there she is. There, is. there, is. there, is. there <laughs> they are. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, today, uh, we have this very special guest because we wanted to go more into Fist of the Ruby Phoenix, the adventure path from Paizo Publishing. Um, it's an awesome, I think, 10 to 20 level campaign. And uh, what more to tell us about, or who, who more to tell us about what you're going to fight and face and experience than an expert. Mm -hmm. Two experts, in fact. <laughs> Two experts in this guy. I'm just here wearing a bright I, orange t-shirt. I, I, I would count myself as maybe half an expert. So you got one and a half. One and a half. And it's better than like the point zero two five that I, yeah. I come rocking up with. So, uh, but yeah, so we're gonna talk about monsters. If you're playing this adventure path, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell your GM you're cheating, but you're cheating. If you aren't playing this adventure path, then hopefully these really cool uh, folklore creatures and kind of the real stories and cultures and mythologies they come from kind of spice of imagination and you know you can use them in your game and you can use them at you know at the table mm -hmm. so let's let's do a quick introduction because i think i've done a, a pseudo introduction a little too long um let's start of course with our guest eunice please eunice tell us who you are and where we can find you on that sweet sweet internet oh my gosh hi i'm eunice you can also call me yaya you can actually find me on twitch at my hamachi which is why you saw my dog earlier um i stream three times a week i think I think <laughs> um, you can also find me on YouTube. Um, it is uh, Jade Palace. Yeah, yeah. You can find me. What was it? YouTube.com backslash C backslash Jade Palace. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the thing. Anyways, you can find me on there. I make uh, videos about traditional Chinese um, culture, history, fashion, all that fun stuff. And you can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at my Hamachi or at Jade Palace. Yeah, yeah. As well, you can also find me on Teespring where I sell my own design T-shirts. Mm. Finally wearing one today. <laughs> hey. Oh, that's Hi. amazing. You made that? Thanks. Yeah, this is the Hama Jiangshu, which is perfect for today. Oh, that's Absolutely. super cute. That's super cute. Uh, well, of course, we have we have our one solid special guest expert. Let's go to our point five special guest expert, uh, who is also my co-host, Michael Powell. Please tell who you are and where we can find you on that sweet, sweet internet. Well, as always, I am the dastardly, dashing Michael Pal, and you can find me all over the internet on my social medias, which is at Mr. Kapow, that's M-R-K-A-P-A-O. How about you, PJ? Oh, uh, you know me, I'm PJ McGaw, everywhere at PJ.McGaw, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, come find me, come friend me, and let's have fun. I already know that song in dance, but we're going to get into it uh, because he's a really cool and I can't yeah. wait to hear the stories and I can't wait to learn about what, you know, we could be fighting. Mm -hmm. um, also, do you mind, uh, I, I, there's one thing I forgot to uh, mention during our Look Behind the Veil production meeting. Yeah. Um, when we're going through each of these uh, creatures, uh, mm -hmm. would you mind if I also source them as which book of the Adventure Path they're from and what page? I think it'd be awesome. I think because that's it's a great cheat sheet for GMs and players alike. Yeah. And also for everybody who's going to be watching this on YouTube later, I will be putting a picture up uh, some somewhere ish here of mm -hmm. the creatures that we are going to be discussing today. Yeah. In uh, post. In little... post. <laughs> in post. Yes. So you're not going to get live. So sorry. But if you go to our YouTube and check it out. Incentive. <laughs> Incentive, yeah. Check it, go to our YouTube, like, comment, uh, hit, the space, hit the subscription button, uh, all that silly crap. But we're going to get started, as always, we're going to our wonderful friends at Archives of Methodist who do a great job of putting all this information together. Uh, and I believe we decided to start with the Kun, is that correct? Yes. I... All right. This is a CR-14 creature. Um, it is. It has the traits of uncommon, neutral, evil, gargantuan, aquatic beast, and cold. Um, your stats is it's got a plus 27 to perception, makes sense for level 14. It's got dark vision, light blindness, and wave sense 60 feet. Mm. So it's able to like sense everything in the water around it 60 feet. Mm -hmm. It speaks the language of water. 
It has a nice chunk of acrobatics, 25, athletics, 29, intimidation, 22, and survival, 25. This thing is strong. It comes walking in the door with a plus eight to strength, mm -hmm. plus four dex mod, seven con modifier, plus one intelligence, plus five wisdom, plus four charisma. This guy is, it, it, and this is normal. If you elite this bad boy, it's going to get worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty beefy. Oh, this is this is a beefy boy if there ever was one. Oh, actually, no, not beefy, because that's 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 beef. So this would be this is fishy. This is fishy. He's a fishy, fishy boy. <laughs> yeah, the fishy boy. <laughs> we're gonna need a new emote, PJ. Oh, uh, yeah, we gotta we gotta update our emotes anyway. I think we got some really great ones, but why not get more? Um, yeah, but this guy's tough too. He's got an AC of thirty six at level fourteen, plus twenty nine for two saves, plus twenty four reflex, plus twenty three. Will. A little light on the will, but I mean, he has to have some weakness, right? Speaking yeah. of weaknesses, we're cheating here on this one. He's got a good 10 weakness. Weakness, good 10. So if you have a paladin who's using, using those smites damage, that's a good way mm -hmm. to go. But a resistance of cold 10. So if you're like a water elemental um, some uh, sorcerer, you might have a hard time. Especially because this guy's rocking up with 230 HP. That's so this guy's more of a yeah. boss creature. For lower levels, this would be kind of a... Yeah, as you said, PJ, a boss fight. Yeah. Now, I'm going to kind of skip over the attacks because they're pretty straightforward. Uh, you got a melee for jaw, a melee for tail. They're doing about 3d12 plus some very strong damage. The big one is the jaws has an automatic grab feature. Mm -hmm. um, it has primal spells because it is, I guess, a creature of nature. Uh, it has control water at will, seventh level version of it. Darkness at will and wall of ice. Ooh. So this thing is this thing is very uh, controlling. It controls the environment very well. Mm. And the big thing it has is funnel, heart of darkness, and swallow hole. Now funnel is um, kind of a save or suck situation here. Ironically, it sucks in heat and all creatures in the water in a sixty foot cone. Creatures in the area must exceed a DC thirty three fortitude save or take. 10d8 cold damage. That's up to 80 cold damage. Uh, the Kuhn uh, cannot funnel again for their 1d4 rounds. On a critical success, you are unaffected. On a success, you take half. Failure, not only do you take up to 80 damage, but you are pulled 30 feet towards the creature. Critical fail, double the 80s. So you Ooh. can take 160 damage. That's going to kill most of y'all. Yeah. And then you get pulled 60 feet towards the creature. Uh, so this thing clearly wants to fight you all in the water. Mm -hmm. Heart of Darkness. Whenever the Kuhn makes an attack from the area of darkness, their attack deals an additional 2d6 evil mm. damage. And last but not least, the Swallow Hole attack. If they're already grabbing someone, I think they get bonuses for this, uh, but you roll the hit doing 3d12 plus 7 bludgeoning damage, and then you're basically you're now being swallowed and being slowly kill with that 3d12 plus 7. Mm -hmm. If someone can do, I think, about 30 damage to the creature, though, that's the rupture point, they will be spat out. Yeah. And but this thing yeah. sounds like a friggin' nightmare to fight. It's pretty much a combo of funnel and then swallow hole, really. Oh my goodness, and if you're in water, forget about it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that's what this entire creature wants to be. So yeah. GMs, if you're going to use this creature, your tactic is you want to put it in the water, surprise attack him with darkness spells, suck them all in, mm -hmm. And then just start biting them left yeah. and right through that extra 2d6 damage and possibly even kill them before you get to swallow yeah. them whole. Uh, PJ, do you mind if I do the next part? Sure, uh, sure. Which is pretty much if um, your players are looking to uh, find out more information about this creature, a recall knowledge check beast can be made, which is either, uh, either arcana or nature with a DC of 34. And the additional information here that's presented here is called Change of Heart. The coon hunts at the bottom of the cold, dark sea. But if shown, uh, but if shown the light of the sun, a coon begins to understand that it dwells within a different, bigger world. When flocks of birds or schools of fish cast their dappled sh shadows upon a coon, they might grow weary of their solitude and become curious about the realm above. In extremely rare circumstances, and for their own mysterious reasons, a coon might sacrifice some of their power to undergo a permanent one-time transformation. In a final dramatic act, the coon flings himself 
up and out of the ocean, allowing the sun to fully wash over them. In the process, the coon transformed from the hateful fish to a noble and curious bird called the the ping. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, it's it's pong. Right? Pong, it's pong, 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 pong. Pong. I was like, wait, wait, wait! I'm gonna mess it up. I'm gonna mess it up. I messed it up. <laughs> behind, behind the curtain, we were talking before we were getting in here, just making sure like all the words were accurate and, and kind of putting a collective effort forward. And and Eunice was like, "Ping? No, it's Pong." And and Michael's like, "I'm doing my best." And she's like, "Come on." She's like Mandarin. Like I got like look, I got no like to stand on here. I recognize I'm walking into this with very little education or training. I'm just here to have a good time and uh -huh. learn. Uh, also, I want to read the... Actually, you know what? Uh, Eunice, why don't you read the flavor text that's right above? It's right under the Kun title? Hungry wait, 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 and Resentful? Give me one sec. Wait, what? Uh, do you want to read the flavor text of uh, Hungry? It basically starts off Hungry and Resentful. Oh, okay, okay, cool. So the right on top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Hungry and resentful, the malevolent kun is a mytho mythological fish monster that dwells in the remotest, coldest depths of the ocean. This massively powerful creature could easily rule as a subaquatic dom rule a subaquatic domain, if they care to. But kuns are also famous for their total self-absorption and complete ambivalence towards other forms of life. A quinn remains as far away from other creatures as they can, subsisting on, on only their own icy hatred. They can consume and digest prey, but such feedings are incidental. Most quins remain ignorant and uncaring, keeping themselves in the dark, disregarding any signs of life around them except for to occasionally lash out with a spiteful attack. I... I know people like this. Yeah. I know this is this is a mood. I know a lot of people who are just like this on Facebook. It's, uh -huh. it's bad. Um, also, uh, oh, Adam Generator posted, uh, from what book is that? Uh, this is from the Pathfinder uh, one, number 167, Ready Fight, on page 79. Yeah, and this is a part of the um, uh, Fist the Reef Phoenix uh, Adventure Path that has come out. Mm -hmm. um, so you can absolutely fight this or steal this because this thing has a nasty one-two punch. Yeah. Uh, he also posted, uh, uncommon creatures tend to be semi-bosses or bosses creatures. Uh, it has to be 30 piercing or slashing damage to rupture. Yes, uh, that is absolutely correct. Looking at the thing, the rupture point does say 30. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that is usually um, uh, one or two types of melee damage, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I think... I think depending on how your GM kind of hand waves it, it could also just be eh, yeah. 30 of whatever kind of damage. Mm -hmm. um, and, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And Eunice, um, do you... Uh, wow, why am I... Uh, I'm stumbling. I'm stumbling today. But um, I so, personally... Would it be okay to do the punk first too? Because, oh, okay. Yes, because this is going to be... A, it, it ties in. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you know what? Uh, then why don't we jump in with... Uh, what is it? Why don't you read the... It, the intro uh, flavor text for uh, the creature. The punk? The punk. Okay. <laughs> Ping? Ping. Ah! <laughs> Never going to let you down. <laughs> let, that, let that go. <laughs> All right. So, so what is it? How's it supposed to be pronounced? Just so me and everyone at home can, okay. can learn the lesson. So it's punk, second tone. So it's punk, 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 punk. So it's punk. You go up. Punk, punk, punk. Punk. Nice. Uh, before I do switch to Pong, uh, Pong, Pong, I want to <laughs> Pong. Before I switch to Pong, I want to ask more about about uh, uh, Kun. Kun, Kun is first tone, so it's just monotone. So Kun, Kun, got it. Quin. I, this is let's pick your brain because like this sounds like a very fascinating creature. Does this does this spark any like memories of stories about this this fish or any legends or or anything else that you recall? So the thing with this fish, it's quite interesting. It's um, so this fish, uh, it's actually is not as important as you think. It's the next form that's actually most important, oh. um, which we we will go into. But yeah. the um, so the thing about the quin, it's like it's said to be like massive, like it is huge, mm -hmm. so big that like we actually don't know the actual size mm -hmm. of these fish. Sometimes other people are like, oh, what? it's probably a whale or something like that, but it's so much bigger than that. Like, a quin can be like 
at least a couple thousand miles like long. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And um, there's actually a movie called uh, Da Yu, which means big fish, which mm -hmm. was like one of China's like top like animation film within the last couple years, and it deals with the idea of a Quinn, and it's actually a really good movie. Mm -hmm. Kind of, <laughs> so, it, it kind of reminds me just from reading it. Um, that one fish, that the dragon fish, the really big, long fish with kind of that overbite. Arowana? I yeah, I think so. I think that's what they are. Like, they're like, the ones that, that's in Devotion, that one? Yeah. <laughs> Arowanas. Arowanas, yeah. It kind of reminds me of that fish a little bit. Like, a mythological version of that fish. <laughs> Looking at the photo, I was like, it looks like a catfish. <laughs> it yeah. does, though. The picture it looks, looks like a little a catfish. like a catfish. Mm -hmm. But the arowana is also because it says uh, the coon uh, jumps up. I know the arowanas, they yes. also are fish that really, like, if they're in the we'll wild, jump. Mm -hmm. will jump high. Yeah. To get prey, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and for that's, the... yeah, that's how my marijuana died. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, poor it, thing. Jumped, it jumped out of the tank. Uh, to let you guys know, uh, if you're looking at the, ne the Archives of Nethys website, the image they have from Paizo looks like a giant purple evil catfish. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's an accurate depiction or not. I do know there are some l lower, like, legends of catfish, but I think they're Japanese, not Chinese. Yeah. I the think ones I'm if, thinking of. If anything, I think they're taking, some of the stuff is taking artistic license. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, so... Now uh, we've done Quinn, and now we're going to do uh, Pong. 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 Got to, I got to do the arm gesture so Pong. I can remember. Pong. Uh, Pong. <laughs> so we're moving on to Pong, and uh, uh, I guess I'll take it away with the, the uh, stats really fast. Um, this is a CR-12 creature, which I, I run because I believe this comes from the CR-14 fish. Mm -hmm. becomes a CR or level 12 bird. It's a rare, neutral, good gargantuan air beast of cold probably because it's used to the water. Perception of plus 25, plus 4 strength, plus 6 dex, plus 5 con, plus 3 int, plus 5 wisdom, plus 7 charisma. So this thing, its, it's stats change a lot. Probably mm -hmm. to make up for the fact that it's now flying, so it's going to need a different stat block. Uh, acrobatics plus 23, athletics 22, but now it gets a nature check of plus 25, and it can finally speak the language that all living beings speak, common. Uh, AC 32, still a beast. 23 uh, fortitude, 24 reflex, 23 will. So its saves have changed drastically. Uh, it only has 200 HP as opposed to the 230 that it had before. Uh, but now it gets a weakness against evil attacks. So it gets a weakness evil 10. Still has a cold resistance. Um, this has an aura. So all those fighting it and GMs be aware. This has a calm weather aura. It's air, aura, evocation, and primal uh, traits. It's a one-mile aura. This is basically narrative powers at this point. The ambient weather around a pong is always uh, lightly cloudy with a pleasant breeze. The temperature is pleasantly warm for the season. A creature that attempts to alter the weather, the weather within this aura, such as controlled weather ritual or a localized effect like gust of wind, Wow, must succeed a DC 33 will save. Otherwise, the effect is disrupted. Uh, I'm really curious about why that may be coming from. The Pong can activate or deactivate this aura as a single action. Uh, it has a, wow, it has a, uh, a movement of 10 feet, but it can fly at a speed of 70. Um, basic striking, it does the, the beaks and the, and the um, talons because it's a bird. Uh, about 3d8 plus 10 or 3d6 plus 10. Uh, the, it still has its magic from before. It has two new attacks. Cloud cover, which it creates a thick cloud that envelops themselves in the mist. So this basically cr uh, creates cover for the creature until the next turn. It's one action to use, mm -hmm. no limitations. You're just constantly giving yourself cover. Flap wings. The, uh, the Pong beats its wings to create a mighty burst of frosty air and pushes away foes. Each creature within 10 feet of the Pong takes 3d6 bludgeoning and 3d6 cold damage with a DC 32 basic reflex save, so that can double on a critical fail. Creatures that fail their save are pushed away 10 feet. People that uh, Critical uh, fails are pushed 20 feet and knocked prone. Uh, the, the Pong can't use this ability again for another 1d4 rounds. I think that's kind of a limitation they're putting, so you don't 
abuse this ability. Uh, and Wind Slice. Pongs can move in any wind with any with easy grace. Uh, Pong can. I'm probably. I'm not getting that. I feel like I'm not getting that. <laughs> you're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> uh, ignores difficult terrain caused by wind and doesn't need to maneuver in flight in high winds. So this is really great if you want to play uh, and like an like a, a boss fight in the air against people on the ground, or if you want to have an aerial dog fight between like I don't know you riding a dragon, or in the case of Edge of Legends, you all riding bats, versus this level twelve bird creature. So as a GM. The tactic on this guy definitely seems to be hiding and using air maneuverability to just beat people up. Um, really curious about that that automatic like shutting down of any wind spells. That's a very interesting specific thing. Yeah, um, I mean it. That it could, that could tactically that is super useful, especially if um, well. If it's a flying creature, you're going to have to go, you know, kind of fight it in the air anyway. And then it has the ability to shut you down from the air. That's very tactically useful. What makes it even scarier is that it, the, the aura range is one mile. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a huge thing. So if you're playing this game, like, mm -hmm. like Eunice, if you're playing this game, let's say you're a cleric of uh, storms, right? Or um, weather. And you start trying to use your magic that your god gave you and suddenly it's not working. That, this bird could be literally anywhere within a mile radius of your location, wow. and that's a big story beat. Mm -hmm. Like, for one whole mile, I get, it's like, yeah, I'm, it's the bird. The bird has a mile. Yeah, the bird could just, like, be chilling at the border of that mile, just, like, yeah. just chilling, just chilling, just chilling. <laughs> and you're like, what's going on? <laughs> now, I don't know the significance of the, the, uh, the pong, other than, like, it's what the coon becomes when they mm -hmm. leave the water. Um, but I'm just imagining mm -hmm. this thing chilling in a nest somewhere, like, Who's messing with my breeze? <laughs> Caw -ca. uh, PJ, shut you um, down. I'm not sure I, if you uh, touched on this yet. The one, the the the, 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 the creature's ability. I, I talked about wind slice, flap wings, and cloud cover. I did um, not get the clear direction. No, I was gonna say. Uh, I think you may have. Uh, I skipped over heaven's view. Oh, I'm not seeing that at all. This is the pong, right? This is yeah. This is the. It's right under the stats. It's called Heaven's View. Clouds don't impair a Pong's vision. Yeah, weirdest thing. I'm not seeing it. Eh, whatever. Either it's way, right, it's right under the, like, the Strength Dex cons. Right under there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I see now. It is definitely... It's a, it's a yeah. sneaky one. So pretty much if... Um, if you try to create any clouds or anything like that, thinking you're going to try to impair its vision from seeing you... Yeah, that's not going to fly. Literally, I ain't going to fly. <laughs> Absolutely. This uh -huh. is, uh, and jumping in the chat really fast, I'm seeing we have a first-time chatter. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher your name. I'm so sorry. Fay Liar 04? Fay Lear? Fayolry? Um, yes, this is not a homebrew. This is actually a Pathfinder, uh, I should say, Paizo Canonical Monsters from mm -hmm. the Adventure Path, the Fist of the Ruby Phoenix, which takes place in sort of a, a really cool fantasy, I believe it's like a fantasy China. I think it's called Tian... Tianxia. I would say Asia. Asia. Yeah. Asia. Asia, yeah. It's definitely more um, um, specific but inclusive. Yeah. And also uh, the source of this creature, the Peng, the Ping? I, I, I know, I know, I... <laughs> I know. Is that an E or is that an I? E. Okay. How do we pronounce E sounds? <laughs> You're like ring out the kindergartner teacher in me again. Michael, I got the your back. I can feel the disappointment the ping, coming from her. The ping. <laughs> pong. The pong. The pong. All right. The pong. <laughs> Oh my goodness. But either way, uh, the source um, for this creature is in the Adventure Path number 167. Uh, the book is titled Ready Fight, and the page is number 82. Ooh. Yeah. And uh, just, I'm going to jump in uh, really quick. If your players want more information about this creature, it can make a recall knowledge check. Beast which is either a arcana or nature with a DC of 35, and the information that they provided here is titled Clear Direction. Yeah. Most, 
most uh, most ping pong most pongs on galarian are seen in the skies of southern uh zhang tang tianxia 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 so means uh tianxia means um tianxia means heaven basically anything other than heavens tian is sky xia is down uh okay they're hardly ever they hardly ever roost or even stop to rest and they are almost always seen headed in a suddenly trajectory trajectory according to the the i don't know why I keep mis mispronouncing it i don't know why the uh -huh. pong uh -huh. themselves pong themselves they have no destination they are headed south and even they don't know why some whimsical pong bing huh. pong pong I was right the first time. Yes. Claim that they are in pursuit of a dream they once had in a life they live long before this one. So that's actually really interesting because if it has a life cycle where it becomes a kun, does that mean they are flying to the southern like ocean area to transform once again into the fit their uh, fish forms and the fish form fl swim up north? become the their bird form becoming kind of a cycle um, I, think, I don't i don't know the story uh but i definitely like it it definitely sounds like a a, a story i've heard before you know the idea that like, they're following a dream that they don't even recognize which i mean can't we all identify with that i'm just trying to live my dream what is that dream mm -hmm. to have a dream man i don't know uh uh, so I, yeah. I think I overstepped. I'm sorry. What was that? I was gonna say, uh, Eunice, do you want to read the flavor text of the okay. bong? Good. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm a Chinese school teacher too. So. <laughs> you know what? I'm just gonna say. Sometimes we all have certain words that we kind of just stumble oh, no, on. Yeah. And today is for me is bong. Good. <laughs> Anyway, concentration. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peng are massive avian beasts who fly effortlessly among the highest clouds. Their bright plumage makes it difficult to see their shape against an azure sky. But with patience, an onlooker might notice movement too swift to be a natural cloud. Beautiful and graceful, Peng arise from the unlikeliest of origins, the cruel Kun a hateful fish monster whose pre predilection for the crushing depths of the sea matches the Pung's own love of the bright open sky. After a Quinn sacrifices their power for a noble heart by bathing in the sun's ray, they transform into this magical bird, which eschews violence. I can't see, I can't do that word. <laughs> um, ensues. Ensues. Is that how you saw ensues? Oh my god. Hold on. Uh, let me see. I want to make sure I get this right because I know sometimes words get weird. I totally lost the reading, but if it's E S E S C H E U, I think it's askew. Askew, excuse, excuse or shoes, excuse or shoes. One of those two, but I think that's okay. about right. <laughs> okay, cool. Violence unless they must fight to stay free. Pung do not seek danger or thrills. They want only to make their long voyages and fly without disruption. A Pung's calm and steady nature is so strong that its mere presence can quell storms and still winds. Mariners and pilots believe spotting a Pung is a sign of good luck. When the sky is clear and blue and the weather gentle for an extended period, people attribute such fine conditions to the presence of an unseen Pung. So yeah, the, the whole, it, it could be a mile away and their abilities still work. Yeah, that's actually really kind of cool. So it's like it, it, it brings us good luck for like um, uh, sailors, sailors yeah. so they they shut down, you know, negative weather conditions. I like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, on the cu cultural background front, um, I know we were gonna discuss more about the kun and the the pong. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you have for us, uh, Eunice? Okay, so the thing about the quin and the pung is that you can't have one without the other. Mm. You cannot have a pung without a quin. And so this is a shape-shifting beast. Mm -hmm. um, this is also a very, very ancient beast. Like we, uh, the idea of a quin and pung is 
The first uh, written record of a Kun and Peng is during the Warring States era, which is around 400 to 400 and something to 200 and something BCE during the Warring States era. And so, um, as I said, a Kun is a massive, massive uh, fish creature that is sometimes referred to as a whale. And um, a Kun will transform into a Peng, and the Peng is just as huge. A Peng, like their wingspan is equally as massive. And they, it's said that a single flap of their wing can like travel them like at least a thousand miles. Ooh, wow. And um, so the Peng is also a symbol of great aspiration and um, in Chinese culture. Mm. But um, so what's interesting is that like we first see this creature in a Taoist text called uh, Zhuangzi, uh, which is named after ironically its author whose name is also Zhuangzi. <laughs> um, and uh, the transformation of the Kun to the Peng is actually a symbol of one that puts pursuit of moral integrity before one's moral life. So basically, it's about the transformation of ourselves. That um, a, um, so the reason why it starts as a fish is because it's just as it is, but it refuses to continue being a fish. It wants to become better. And so it has the courage to transform itself. And when a punk flies, it's not flying on wind, but on its virtue and its power. So that's the amazing thing about a Quinn and Punk. It's supposed to talk about the potential of us as human beings, how we can transform from something so low, something so like, you know, just on to something that is like ascends higher. And, um, and I, I guess like they mentioned it in the thing was like they keep on flying to like the place, like a Southern place. Um, so it's in the mythology as well that a Punk will continue to fly towards like, I believe it was like a heavenly lake mm. and that, Pursuit is supposed to symbolize the pursuit of us towards something better. Oh. In a way, if you wanted to uh, liken it to something that we could, it's kind of like enlightenment for us to continue more and more to become better versions of ourselves. Oh, hmm. that's that's really cool. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I do I do hear that uh, a lot in mythology about the constant like continuation for perfection, for, mm -hmm. for improvement, and for enlightenment. That's, I, I, I didn't know that was the case with uh, the bird and the fish. Uh, it's really sweet. Out of curiosity, like, so the quin uh, turns into the uh, pong, pong. Mm -hmm. Pong? I, got, I think I got that right. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, does the quin come from anything? Are they born or are they just kind of like around? They're, they're just creatures in itself. So they're just kind of born as quin. And not all quin can transform into pung. Mm -hmm. It's just the quin that decides that it, ne it wants to become something more, that mm. it's able to uh, get, like, move off like the beaten path, like to take that, as I said, the courage to transform, to take, to take courage and to like, explore something that they didn't i kind of want to say it's a little bit it's like a more of a i guess a metaphysical version of a butterfly's uh, metamorphosis yes mm. yeah but then the thing about caterpillars almost all caterpillars will turn yeah. into the thing but with the quinn it's um sorry it's really hot in my room um with the quinn it's um not all quinn will turn into pung but mm. it's those that turn into pung that becomes this majestic oh, beast okay. that ventures more nice yeah. uh i want to take a quick second to jump into the uh chat penguin witch doctor wants you michael to cosplay uh quinn uh we got waffle maple syrup in the chat great to see you guys we love you as always uh i see uh phil phil ire 04 uh, who I'm probably butchering your, your name. I apologize. Please let me know how to pronounce that. Uh, but you asked if you wanted to, uh, if we would let you put up your homebrew characters. Absolutely. If you want to go into more detail, please join our Discord. I think we actually have a homebrew or world yeah. discussion place. And you can you can regale us with all your stuff. Mm -hmm. We can't wait to hear about it. Yeah. Uh, also, there they also posted, uh, I like how there's so much Asian inspiration in Pathfinder. Kitsunes, Tengus, Tengus, and etc. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. really cool. And also... I do, I do like how they also kind of put, and some of them they kind of put their own spin on it to make it their own. You know, mm -hmm. they're not just copy pasting it entirely into their worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also uh, replying to Penguin Witch Doctor, um, I hope that's only because of 
my facial hair and not because I'm toxic or something like that. <laughs> what? Not, I don't think you're toxic at all. I would love to see, like, Michael Pow, the, the Quinn, or, like, you know, this, this badass, uh, uh, oh, gosh, I want to say in Japanese mythology, there's the, the giant uh, catfish that causes earthquakes. Uh-huh. That's right. That's the story I remember. Uh, so you can, do, you can do that, too. Be but, a whisker uh, fish. Yeah. You know what? I, I, that'll be my uh, costume uh, for Halloween. I'll just put a giant fish thing on my head. <laughs> hey, we've already done a catfish character build. You, yep. can, you can make another catfish yeah. character build. Uh, why don't we jump into our next uh, creature? And it's so funny you said jump because we're yep. going to uh, cover the provincial Zhongxi. Uh, this is a CR11 creature. And if you don't know what the Zhongxi is, uh, I would, you know, I'll give you a small hint, but I cannot wait for uh, 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 Eunice and Michael to go into more details. It is the, the hopping vampire. Mm-hmm. See him in a few movies here and there. Um, the provincial Zhongxi is a CR11 creature. They are chaotic evil. They're about human size so medium sized and they count as both undead and vampire so if you are a paladin now's the time to get your oath of uh undead slaying and smitey smitey uh they have a perception of plus 22 they have breath sense precise 60 feet put a bookmark in there for later because i want to know what the heck that's all about and they get dark vision uh they speak tian uh the language of tian shui tan xia sorry tian xia uh, they speak Necrol, which is the language of the world of the dead, and they speak common. Uh, they have acrobatics of plus 16, uh, athletics of 22 for all that jumping, intimidation of 20, and religion 22. They have a plus 5 to strength, so these will definitely be uh, a melee fighter. Um, they have plus 3 to dex, plus 4 to con, 3 int, 7 wisdom, so they may have some really good saves as well as potential magic. Let's see later. Charisma 3. And they come equipped with a plus one striking mace. Yep, these guys are smashy, smashy. They're, they're here to fight. Uh, they have an AC 31, pretty tanky for level 11. They have a 21 fort, an 18 reflex, and a 24 will. Ironic that they're so, like, jumpy, and they actually kind of do badly on the dexterity and the reflex. Um, they have 100 H, 130 HP, but uh, players beware. They have a fast healing of 10. Ooh. And negative healing. So if you try to cast a uh, harm on them or any any spell that does negative damage, you're just gonna make their day. Um, and it has to be called one more breath. Ooh, they are immune to death effects. So make sure you know what your traits are before you're doing a spell. They're immune to disease, paralyzed, poison, sleep. They're immune to being knocked prone, which is really cool because I imagine they just kind of jump back up. Um, they are ten physical. Sorry, they have resistance physical ten, except to dark wood. Uh, and they have something called the Jiangxi Vulnerabilities. Don't know what that is. And something called the Warped Fulu. Don't know what that is either. I'll have to check the notes as we go along. They have a basic... Um, they can only move 15 feet. They have something called Rigor Mortis in their speed. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Please tell me, chat, because this is ridiculous. They, get, uh, they have a Claw Attack, which is 2d10 plus 11. It comes with a grab, so that's a good... That, it's ironic. Their claws are actually more powerful than their mace, which does 2d6 plus 11. You're better off as a GM just grabbing your opponents. Uh, and then just you know, jumping and mm-hmm. pile-driving them. Uh, they do have divine innate spells. Thank God that's what we need that high wisdom for. DC 32 plus 22 attack spell, uh, spell attack roll. They get a 6-level harm. They get 7 6-level six harms. That is, I want to say... 6d8, and if you make it a two-level casting, that's 6d8 plus 8 times 6 if it stacks. I always get that confused if it does or doesn't. Either way, that's a lot of damage. They can do 7 times a day. They get Spirit Blast, Vampiric Exsanguination, Shadow Blast, Innervation, Ghostly Tragedy. They get two of those, and they get Bind Undead and Fear times 3. GMs, if you want to ruin your party's good day, get... And, and they have, like, any a, a cleric, any cleric at all. Throw, like, three of these at your party. Mm. They're, they're going to hate you for life. This, this thing is <laughs> devastating. Because uh, it has no – I mean, it has a Jiangxi vulnerability, which I don't know what that means. Um, and they also been called uh, Drain Chi. I believe qi. it's Chi. Uh, when draining Chi, the provincial Jiangxi regains 13 HP. So they can, they can drain Chi as one action – for a 13 HP heal. Mm-hmm. 
looking for the vulnerability, so I know what the heck I'm looking at. Okay, it's in it's in the basic Jiangxi abilities, but I will save that for Michael to read. I think that's it's, that's it's better that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this thing just raw stats without any of its really cool personal stats. This can really ruin a party's good day with its fast healing ten, the negative healing factor, and the spells that it has that can do a lot of damage. So GMs. If you want to get nasty, this is how you get nasty. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot of versions of the Jiangxi uh, in Pathfinder. Uh, the level 11 is the Provisional, and there's a Minister version at level 14. Um, as PJ said, these are basically like Chinese vampires. <laughs> Essentially, if you want to break it down, you know. Um, let's see. Creating, uh, creating a Jiangxi... Jiangxi when it's best to create a Jiangxi from scratch, you could turn an existing living creature into a Jiangxi using the following steps. So, which means, this technically means anything could be turned into a Jiangxi. So, if you want, if you have, oh, honestly, if you have a character or even a creature that dies and you want to bring them back, and you're playing kind of a, kind of a Asian setting. This is a really cool way to kind of bring them back from the quote-unquote dead. Uh, you could increase the creature's level by one and change the stats as follows. It gains the undead and vampire traits and usually becomes evil. Uh, increase the creature's AC, attack modifiers, DCs, saving throws, and skill modifiers by one. Reduce the creature's speed by 10 feet to a minimum of 15 feet. So it does become slower. Increase the creature's damage with strikes and other offensive abilities by one. If an ability can be used only a small number of times, such as a dragon's breath weapon, increase the damage by two instead. Wow. The, a Jiangxi dragon. I'm, I'm envisioning a dragon that's just hopping along now. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of envisioning like... And this just came to my head because it's small and, and animated, but like like Mushu from Mulan with like the hands out and the yeah. jumping. And it's like, I Mulan, I do not want to be doing this, yeah. Mulan. Also, uh, you reduce the creature's HP by the amount listed on a table that's provided um, on the bottom really quick. Like starting level, uh, like if it's 3 to 4, minus 20 HP. 5 to 7, minus 30, 8 to 14, minus 40, and 15 plus, minus 60. The Jiangxi also gains the fast healing and resistance to physical damage, except for Darkwood, as indicated on the table. These abilities are the reason Jiangxi have less HP. So, that means it's kind of a trade-off. You do have less HP, but they kind of heal super... They have the Wolverine, the, you know... Mutant uh, X Factor healing, so the low yeah. HP doesn't really matter that much because you're just gaining it back. I do kind of like that uh, a Jung Shi is is it is a creature of its own making, but you as GM have the freedom to like put that into anything else, like for storytelling. Like if you want to make like a barbarian Jung Shi villain to fight mm -hmm. or something, I, I think that's kind of cool, and they give you a nice template breakdown for creating your own Jung Shi. And uh, really quick, I'm also going to go through uh, the Jiangxi's uh, unique abilities uh, real quick. One is called One More Breath, which is a divine necromancy and negative ability. Unlike other undead, a Jiangxi isn't destroyed at zero HP. Instead, they fall unconscious and awaken in one minute with one hit point. Wow, that is not even an hour, a minute. Wow. Uh, scattering at least one bulk of glutinous rice or hen eggs on an unconscious Jiangxi destroys them permanently. Okay, I like that. I, that's really good flavor there. Uh, if a Jiangxi was reduced to zero HP by an attack made from dark wood, they're also destroyed immediately. Mm. Uh, see, the Jiangxi's uh, vulnerabilities uh, let's see, are revulsion. A Jiangxi can't voluntarily come within a 10 feet of a brandish mirror or the sound of ring handbells. A creature can interact with a mirror or handbell to banish or ring that item for one round, similar to 
raising a shield. If the Jiangxi involuntarily comes within 10 feet of an object of their revulsion, they gain the fleeing condition. Uh, running from the object of their revulsion until they are 10 feet or further from the object. After one round of being exposed to the object of their revulsion, a Jiangxi could attempt a DC 25 will save as a single action, which has the concentration of uh, concentrate feet. On a success, they overcome their revulsions for 1d6 rounds or one hour on a critical success. And then there's uh, something called the bitter epiphany. A Jiangxi is affected by severe um, mela, melancholia. Me, 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 melancholia. Mm. When reminded of their debased nature and the truth of their existential disconnection from living beings. Same. <laughs> Same. <laughs> that quarantine life, though. Yeah. When a Jiangxi sees an altar of at least one bulk of food offerings to ancestor spirits, they attempt a. They must attempt a DC 25 will save. They are then temporarily immune to their bitter epiphany for a minute. Critical success. They're unaffected. Success. Uh, the Jiangxi is stupefi stupefied for one round. Failure. They're stupefied for two. Uh, stupefied two for one minute and crit failure. They're stupefied too and confused for a minute. And then also, well, there's a lot here. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, there's warp, a lot I couldn't cover. Yeah, Warped Fulu. I, I'm, I'm guessing that's it. Eunice? Fu, Fu, Fu. You know, Fu. 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 It's, it's the, the talisman. Oh, yeah. Fu. Oh, Fu. Yeah. Fu. Fu. Kind of Fu. <laughs> Fulu. Fulu. Okay. Fulu. Seeing it in English, seeing it written in English really honestly does throw me off. <laughs> I know, the, I always hate it because they never give me tones. Let me see the tone for this one. Uh, fu, some fu. Fu. I know it, the first one is fu. Let me do tra Google Translate just to hear the tones. This is what I do for my videos all the time. It's like, I can't read it. And it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, Google Translate. They'll say it to me. Let me see. But, uh, mm -hmm. Hold on, give me one sec. I got this. It gave me the wrong one. Yeah, Fulu. Fulu. Okay. Fulu. Fulu. Okay. Uh, the Jiangxi has corrupted the Fulu attached to their brow. The Jiangxi is immune to spells cast from a magic item without expending a spell slot, such as a scroll or wand. A creature could steal a Jiangxi's Fulu to remove it, rolling against a Fulu. Jiangxi's Perception DC, this immediately ends the Jiangxi's immunity to these effects. If a creature then destroys a Jiangxi's removed Fulu with a interact action, the Jiangxi also loses their fast healing ability. A Jiangxi could create a replacement Fulu by spending one uninterrupted hour of inscribing, an, uh, inscribing a strip of paper or similar with a writing instrument. Oh, so that that is... Oh, that that is that is really powerful. Um, but yeah, rigor mortis. The Jiangxi also ignores difficult terrains and effects that would render it prone. A Jiangxi can't take the drop prone action, and when a Jiangxi leaps, it doesn't trigger reactions that are normally triggered by move actions, such as attacks of opportunities. See, that's really interesting because we were in the chat, uh, myself and Maple, uh, Waltz and Maple Super talking about this. And I was really confused because I was like, I've never seen rigor mortis attached to movement. Uh, and they were saying it's a really good flavor, and it is a really good mm -hmm. flavor to it. But it's good to know there's also kind of a very interesting mechanic to it. The fact that uh, they cannot willfully go prone uh, from difficult terrain or their own or any effects from that. Uh, they, uh, they can't willfully drop prone. They won't drop prone from different, difficult terrain. And when they leap, they don't provoke attacks of op, which, which is disgusting if you think about it, because they all they they can walk fifteen feet, but if they start leaping around you, mm. you know, all of your reactions are are useless. Yeah. Uh, oh, also, uh, claws. If the base creature had hands, its fingernails thicken and grow into terrible proportions, granting it an arm strike, uh, claw strike that deals slashing damage, has the agile trait and can grab. Use the moderate damage for the creature's level for the strike damage table, and then finally, drain chi, uh, divine and necromancy. Requirement, a grabbed, paralyzed, restrained, unconscious, or willing creature is within the Zheng Shi's reach. The effect is the Jiangxi drains the victim's life energy or chi through their breath. 
This requires an athletic check against the victim's forward to DC if the victim is grabbed and is automatic for any of the other conditions. The victim is drained 1 and the Zheng Shi regains HP equals to 10% of its maximum HP, uh, gaining any access HP as temporary hit points, draining Qi from a creature that already that is already drained doesn't restore any HP to the Zheng Shi, but increases the victim's drain condition value by 1. The victim has ability to cast key spells and can spend one focus point to avoid becoming drained. This protects it from the current attack, not from the subsequent attacks of Drain Chi. A victim's drained condition value decreases one by one every week. If the creature restricts their diet to glutinous rice for at least one day and spends 10 minutes of dancing, jogging, or otherwise engaging in vigorous physical activity by succeeding at a DC 25 athletic check, it reduces its drain condition by one. Whoa, that's I, a lot. <laughs> I love, I love all of that. That is great for combat and great for narrative and drain. The drain condition is nasty. I want to yeah. say it's like, what, 10, 10 HP per level of the character or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, you lose that immediately, and you lose it from your maximum. So almost like take double that, and it's uh, if I recall correctly. So like just just drained one can take yeah. a giant chunk out of a out of a character, mm -hmm. and and I love the fact that it's sneaky because mm -hmm. if you don't do any research, if you don't even care, if you just kind of brush it off, this thing will slowly kill you to death. Yeah, like it's yeah. brutal. Mm -hmm. And for those curious, this is part of the Pathfinder number one six seven Ready Fight book of the uh, Ruby Phoenix Adventure Path on page 86, and if your players wants to do like a Recall Knowledge Undead Religion check, the DC is 28, and actually, you know what, Eunice, why don't you read um, the extra info uh, that you give players, starting with uh, Dreamers of the Dark to Scorned by Heaven and Earth. Oh. It's on the bottom. Okay, awesome. Okay. I see it, okay. So, a Zheng Shi typically arise from priests or holy workers who have died but choose to make their way back from the afterlife. After, oh, in, while in a state of repose, a Zheng Shi is haunted by dream visions of the netherworld. Many recall endless priva privations and instinctively seek to share their agonies while awake. Some recall humiliation and swearing none shall master them again. Even uh, a few even glimpse the multiverse secrets and plot to drain the heavens dry. And unlike their blood drinking cousins, Jiang Shi subsists on mortals' breath and vitality in the form of qi, also known as in some regions as qi. Okay. <laughs> as uh, a Jiang Shi inhales more qi, it becomes stronger in body and mind. A, true, um, a truly gluttonous Jiang Shi becomes even more powerful and attains a higher status than its peers. Such ancient vampires are known as ministers, and they seek to feast on only the most rarefied qi of the cosmos. A typical Tian exorcism for a Jiang Shi involves the subduel of the vampire followed by a lengthy prayer of phrasma. Mm -hmm. uh, the exorcist then affixes a fulu uh, charm upon the Jiang Shu's brow, an object believed to ease the undead's eternal nightmares. Jiang Shu craves qi, but are also repelled by harmonious arrangements of qi, such um, as that which occurs in rice, hen eggs, mirrors, and certain types of wood. Oh, so that's kind of the explanation for like the weaknesses and the ways to make sure they stay dead, they don't come mm. back. It's the harmonious qi in those items that... Yeah. Kind of friends them. It's okay. it's kind of like um in the uh, Western vampires, they are usually um, repulsed by crosses and garlic, that type of thing. For uh, Zheng Shi, it's rice, eggs, mirrors, and wood. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, yeah. The this has been one of the creatures that I was super excited to have Eunice here for because you know what I'm just gonna let her take <laughs> over here on the cultural background and significance because yeah 
it's a headset. This one's kind of long because uh -huh. this one has a lot of significant mm -hmm. background to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to say, yeah, definitely the Jiangshi is one of probably the most popular Eastern beast in Western culture, especially from like a lot of old Kung Fu movies and that kind of stuff. So that's what causes a lot of the change to what we have now. But anyways, so they're called Jiangshi. Jiang means like rigor. Like, you know, when, you, when you're like Jiang, you're stiff. Like sometimes I'm like, oh my God, like, so jiang le means like, oh, my like arm is stiff. And shi means corpse, shi ti. So that's why they're called jiang shi. And um, so jiang shi are not actually a super ancient beast. It's not an ancient, ancient monster from like thousand years ago. The origins of this monster is actually from the last dynasty of the China, uh, which is the Qing dynasty. And um, so this one, you kind of need like a weird his historical background to it. So um, for those who don't know, the last dynasty, um, the Qing dynasty, was not ruled by Han Chinese like most of the other dynasties were, other than the Yuan dynasty. Uh, the, Han, uh, the Qing dynasty was ruled by the Manchurians. And when the Manchurians took over, they were really like, okay, the Han people can't do this, the Han people can't do that, in order to control them, to make sure they don't revolt, to make sure they don't like, you know, do anything. It's just supposed to basically break their spirits. So of course, the Han people are like, super pissed <laughs> they're like excuse me like um like um in han chinese we um don't originally we don't cut our hair because in confucianism we believe that our hair is like because our parents gave it to us we don't cut it we don't do anything to it but the manchurians that's why you see all those chinese dramas the front of their head is bald it's because they pluck it they actually shave their heads and they basically forced um the Han Chinese to like do the same thing. Uh, Han Chinese were not allowed to wear our own clothes. We weren't allowed to wear Han Fu. That's why you have Qi Paul and that kind of stuff because it's actually Manchurian. Anyways, because of that, the Han, Chinese, the Han citizens were pissed. They were like, are you kidding me? I can't do this. You take away my, like, cult my, like, my, my culture, my background and all that stuff. So there's a reason why Jiang Shi, you normally see them in like the robes. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like yeah. the robes, the long robes, yeah. the long sleeves, the hats, the um, design on their chest. Mm -hmm. That's actually the robes of a Qing imperial, like, you know, like advisor, minister. That's the robes that they wear. Okay. The reason why um, they, uh, Zhang Shi is usually depicted as a Qing in advisor because it was just the Han people saying that, look at these Manchurians, they're blood, they're like soul sucking, they're monsters, they like are just trying to like kill us all. And that's actually, so the Jiangsu is actually a, a monster of political unrest. Oh, that's kind of fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so I like, like that. yeah, so prior to the Qing Dynasty, we kind of don't really have this type of monster we actually it's not in any of the it's not in like the chinese bestiary it's not in that kind of stuff um we don't actually really believe in necromancy in chinese culture like traditional traditional we believe yeah you have spirits that can't like go on but not really like zombies mm -hmm. so basically the jiangsu is a political monster it's just like that yeah they're manchurians they're monsters they're so sucking and that kind of stuff and then then popular culture took it exactly and, yeah. so popular culture took it especially with the whole like you know kung fu movies and mm -hmm. they saw the western took it so yeah so originally they're not exactly like vampires vampires and then the whole soul sucking the energy sucking is to represent like they're killing us mm -hmm. and yeah wow. and so let's go to like the why they hop they're called hopping vampires right mm -hmm. yeah so okay this is i'm sorry like jiangshu it has like a whole thing i actually covered this in one of my videos and go it's, for it it's <laughs> crazy okay in chinese culture when we die we are not just buried there it's kind of like we have to go back to our hometown to be buried mm -hmm. we have to go back to Niangjia, Hui Niangjia, like, which is like you know my an the ancestral home mm -hmm. i have to be buried in my ancestral grave or else my spirit is going to be constantly wandering i need to go home so rich people can be like hire like you know a nice like you know carriage and like transport or like a cart and transport the uh, people home the bodies home what do poor people do poor people can't do anything but you still need to bring them home so there is this thing called basically it's corpse transportation for the poor people they will line corpses along a bamboo reed like two long bamboo reeds and they will tie their arms to the reed like this so they're 
and then you have one person in front, one person in back, and the usually the bamboo is sitting on their shoulders, so they're you know they're standing person height. Huh. So you have a line of corpses standing like this, basically dangling from these bamboo reeds. So, but you can't just like lift them up and walk. You know, you're getting tired. So what do you do? You ring a bell, and you lift it up, and you go over. So you lift it up, hoist it over. Lift it up, oh. hoist it over. So they're not just like going like that. So that's why it's hopping because it, it's basically the bodies getting lifted and like move forward, lifted. And they're along the line. Their arms are all straight. So that's why they look, that's why they're hopping. Oh, interesting. And that's, and yeah. Is that why they hate ringing bells? Because it reminds the, them like, you're dead. Basically. Yeah. So the bell is actually quite interesting itself. The bell is also to tell the hoisters to like lift and drop lift and drop but it's also a warning for the living people so tr corpse transportation are usually done in the middle of the night because in chinese culture we don't want to see we do, you don't want to look upon something like this it's considered really bad luck it's not good it's like you see if you see this procession oh my god please go to a temple because you are probably going to have bad luck for the, the rest of your life Thanks. so the bell is also to remind people to let people in the vicinity know that this is happening and stay away. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's also uh, another reason that don't give a bell to an Asian person as a gift. That's oh yeah, really no. That's yeah, really there's a, there, there's so many gift taboos in Chinese culture. Yeah. yeah, don't give a bell. Don't give clocks. Don't give scissors. Um, but what's yeah, the, my, what's the scissors? Is that like oh, cutting ties or something? Yeah, cutting ties. Ah, and, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guessed it. Yes. And then, yeah, uh, but my grandfather actually saw one of this. So my grandfather was, um, it was during the whole, like, you know, the unrest in China, that kind of stuff. He was homeless. And then he was like, yeah, he always told me when I was, like, little. He's like, yeah, I saw Junction. I'm like, what? <laughs> so basically, he was, like, um, that night, like, he was camping out in a graveyard because it's really funny. My grandpa's all like, I'd rather live in the graveyard for the night than inside the temple. Because at nights, they were actually lying the bodies the temples are basically filled with bodies in order for them to stay there for transportation. Mm -hmm. You'd rather live outside on the grave. <laughs> you just, yeah. yeah. So you say that, yeah. <laughs> it's great for camping. You get the stars, the trees. You know, got a lot of great company to talk to. Yeah. You so, know? yeah. So, like, yeah, my grandfather actually, he's like, yeah, I seen it when I was little. And I was like, oh my God. God. I love that. That is so fascinating. Yeah. And, and what I love about, about the, kind of the bridge between these two things is that, you know, all the things you told us, political unrest, the, the mythology that came from political unrest uh, and the culture that also kind of informed it as well, like the ringing of the bell and how mm -hmm. that is a way to scare off this creature because you're letting them know, like there's, you know, you are dead, the dead processional is, is starting. I really love the research they did and also completely fascinating to, to see all that mythology be reflected in the math mm -hmm. of how this creature fights mm -hmm. in a game yeah. that's one part algebra, one part role play. Yeah. Uh, Eunice, I actually have a question for you. Uh, cause I'm not sure because I've seen this in a movie, but I wasn't sure if this is reflected in the folklore mythology of the creature that uh, if you hold your breath, the uh, jump she can't see you. I was going to say that. Okay, so yes, it's originally there wasn't any correlation with that Jiangsu is just oh. basically someone like a Taoist monk it, like okay so basically it's like oh it's the whole Taoist monk controlled and whatever that kind of stuff mm. that actually was born from like uh, media a lot from Hong Kong movies mm -hmm. um the reason why it's like the holding of the breath is because when you're breathing out you technically are emitting essence you're mm. emitting chi like breath signifies life and mm. that's why um like the whole idea of holding your breath is so that like you know you're not breathing out your essence that they can sense but that's okay. born from like definitely media a lot okay. of, yeah a lot of like the whole stuff is actually born from media mm -hmm. like Jiang Shi, yeah. like yeah more um really quick i'm going to jump in the chat because they have some questions uh mm -hmm. pengu chan actually has one that says uh How are Jiang Shi uh the ones that have to count every grain of rice and that's how you get away Pinky Chan. Hi, Pinky Chan. Hello, hi, Pinky Chan. Um, actually, okay, so the reason why, like, a lot of them are associated with rice, because glutinous rice is considered kind of like a sacred rice. It's like, because it's round. Remember, have you noticed, like, a hen egg, all this stuff? Mm -hmm. It's all round. Round is harmony. 
mm. and that kind of stuff. I've actually never heard the like the grains of rice one. Actually, that's actually quite interesting. I, I know. Yeah. Oh, I know. I oh no, my apologies. I don't know if it relates in any way to to Jiangxi or or Asian mythology, but I know that in some sectional mythology for vampires in the West. There's like a strange uh, uh, hyperfixation some vampires in the West have for like counting small items. Like if you throw oh. rice in the ground, they'll just they'll have to like count yeah. the rice and collect it. Or like same with nuts or anything. But that comes from a specific mythology that I don't know because Western vampire mythology is an absolute fluster cluck of young adult fiction writers, uh, ancient war propaganda, or misunderstandings of cultural mm. like mythology or. Or just Anne Rice going crazy with her own little universe. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know. I don't know anymore. Or, or what, you know, what or really good looking, you know, young people with, you know, glitter. Oh yeah. my gosh. Um, I actually am thinking that maybe I think I've seen it. Maybe, but it's remember a lot of the current Jiangshu myths uh -huh. have kind of incorporated Western uh, vampire um, manners as well because of the whole popularity of Jiangshu in Western culture. Um, so as I said, like, I think I've kind of seen that in like the little monk movies. I don't know if you guys seen the little monk movies. Like, yeah, little I have, movie. I have. <laughs> the little monk movies, I love them so much. They're so yeah. cute. Yep. Um, anyways, um, I'm so sad. Like the actor just died. Oh no. Yeah, the, the master just died. It was really sad. Oh yeah, Nick Van Tat. Oh, Nick Van Tat. I don't know if I saw that one, but I saw one of the movies forever ago. And I, I want to say the horrible american localization of the title is like uh oh god like kung fu taoism or something yeah. it was something dumb yeah but uh but basically the idea was you have two two uh martial artists who are also uh priests and they try to like send souls to the afterlife and put them at rest but then jung shi pop up and the whole underworld is kicking off and some evil lord oh is god. manipulating the like obvious edgy renegade priest and they have to go to hell to beat him yep. and at some point a boy becomes pregnant with another boy like like a 12 year old boy becomes pregnant with a six year old kid because he ate an egg that had a spirit put into it and he had to like and, and when they exploded when he exploded the, kid, the kid's alive but like he exploded out of the boy and there's this little bald boy just covered in shaving cream <laughs> i guess to represent the gelatinous rice i don't know mm -hmm. and i'm just watching it i'm like I do not have the education to appreciate what I'm watching. This isn't. This is amazing. Oh yeah, the, like the little the little monk movies are basically there's two two little kid monks and one adult monk who's basically their you know kind of their caretaker guardian. Yeah, yeah. their guardian who's played by you know Nick Man Tat mm -hmm. who's also starred in a lot of movies with Stephen Chow. He, Stephen, Stephen Chow. Chow. Oh my god! You want to know what he mm. what he? I'm sorry. You want to know what was his last thing that he said like his last interview when he what? was alive? So people are asking him, are you ever going to work with Stephen Chow again? Because they actually got into a whole fallout. Mm -hmm. He's all like, as long as I'm alive and as long as he continues to make movies, I would do more movies with him. Mm. And then he died. Oh, no. Oh, man. Yeah. But the, uh, I was going to say, the two little monks are actually two kids. Yeah. One of them is, uh, you know, a, a kid little, that's a really chubby. good at, a little oh, chubby what? kid who uh, <laughs> sometimes wear these dark sunglasses that same ones I kind of wear sometimes. And then uh, the other one is like a, a little kid that's like super good at martial arts. Yeah, and he's like super serious. And the other one, you see the other one, the other little kid monk is always looking at that. He's always like, ha ha ha. Yeah. And he's always peeing on everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> or, 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 or playing a Game Boy. <laughs> I love this. I don't know. I got to watch. This is just a good time. Yeah. Uh, yes. Jumping in the chat. Uh, there's, there's been a, a lot of great conversation. Also, Penku Chan, great to see you. We always love seeing you. Sorry, yes. I'm farming the vault for a card. I know that struggle with Final Fantasy XIV. I hope you get the card. Mm -hmm. uh, Van, it's great to see in the chat. He, uh, they say, I do see a lot of uh, the Jiangxi in Japanese anime mm -hmm. that feature some Chinese culture, but it's usually very little. Example, Shaman King. Yeah. Yeah, it pops mm -hmm. up a lot in Shaman King, I think. Uh, oh, and um, going back to the grain of rice thing, I think this was answered by just what it said. Rip Psyche said, it's, the rice thing is ironically Western. I figured it would be. The carryover from the Fey overlap. Because that's also a fairy thing, usually with salt for the fae. Mm -hmm. yep. um, anything else I'm... Uh... Uh, Adam Generator also posted, uh, Paizo does do their homework. Yeah, they do their homework. Um, I li like I said before, I like how they do it. They, t they take the actual folklore and mythology, and then sometimes they kind of put their own spin on it to make it mm -hmm. fit 
into their world. Yeah. Uh-huh. Paizo has uh, always been really good at like doing the hard work to make sure cultural representation is as accurate as they can be with their resources on hand. You know, the biggest problem is always people. Mm-hmm. Do you have the people that know what you what you need? Do you have people who want to teach mm-hmm. you and tell you what you need to know? Do you have the people to make sure you're going forward and they'll check you if you're going forward in the yeah. wrong direction? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I said, um, like I, said, I really recommend, especially a lot of these indie uh, game designers these days, having uh, was it? Oh god, well, I, I I knew what they were called or, uh, a second ago. I just blanked. Uh, basically, um, oh, sensitivity readers. Mm, mm-hmm. And also yeah. remember to pay your sensitivity readers. Absolutely, hundred mm-hmm. percent. It's a lot of work Unless, that goes into that. Yeah, unless you're just asking for like something just super like like a shallow yeah. thing that you both agree upon, like mm-hmm. I'll tell you this for free because you just need to know this for free. It's mm-hmm. simple stuff. Because mm-hmm. uh, you'd be surprised how much you don't know mm-hmm. until someone tells you you don't know, and yeah. you're like, mm-hmm. "How come no one just tell, talks about this stuff?" Mm-hmm. Um, oh, but ben, I digress. Also, Ben Exel also posted. Uh, also, Dark Stalkers. Yes. Uh, Hose, I got yes. Hose and Co. The the cute girl Jung Shi. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's there's a cute girl, Ch- uh, Chung Shi. She also has like knives that come out of her hands, yeah, and she yeah. drops like weights oh, yeah, and yeah, gunsaws. Yeah, yeah. She's Sorry. actually my main from that game. She's my main in that game. Heck yeah! Mm-hmm. I, what was my main? Well, Dimitri was easy because Dimitri just fought like Ryu, so you couldn't go wrong with him. I liked Tal Bane because I think he's Scottish and I'm Scotch Italian, so that was an easy jump. I like Ripper too, just because he's a zombie skeleton who's a British punk rock. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Oh, I love that dude. He's uh, he's he's silly. Um, oh, I think um, Enos was about to say something. Sorry, I, yes. I think I what? cut you off there. You, you were about to say something when we talked about the Dark Stalker game. Oh no, no! I just like yeah, I remember oh, that. Yeah. One. Like one of my friends cosplayed it. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, oh, really fast! I did see someone in the chat ask about um, why why Darkwood. Uh, the theory they're positing is that it's part of the. Uh, Oh, I'm going to butcher it too. Because they in the chat were like, I don't know what it's called. I'm like, yeah, the elemental trigram. But, pentagram. Um, pentagram. pentagram. The uh, that's the one. Uh, is that why, or is dark wood or any form of wood more of a regional um, mythological thing? So there, we do have sacred woods. Like in Chinese culture, we do have sacred woods. We also, we love like, you know, sandalwood. Sandalwood's considered a very sacred wood. We use it a lot in, um, uh, I think called like in worship and like that's why you have like sandalwood like incense and that kind of stuff um we also love rosewood which i have a rosewood mm-hmm. right here nice. um but yeah so usually yes what um it does correlate with wuxing because like a lot of like notice a lot of especially with jiangshi it deals a lot with feng shui uh like you know the whole fulu and that kind of stuff so yes in itself is also because of the energy of the wuxing but at the same time it's uh it's just Dark wood is considered one of our sacred woods. Mm-hmm. Mm. I will um, say, going back to the breath thing really fast, the whole holding your breath, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it makes sense. Like, if they feed off that, because the breath is the essence of, of life and things like that, it would make sense that you'd probably want to starve them a little bit and keep yourself safe mm-hmm. from being mm-hmm. fed upon by holding your breath. And mechanically speaking, uh, this is one of the few creatures. Now, please, someone correct me if I'm wrong. I probably am. Uh, but I have not seen a lot of creatures in Pathfinder 2 with breath sense mm. precise 60 feet meaning if you breathe anywhere around these guys in 60 feet they know exactly where you are mm. to the t like that's that's so cool and that's so crazy can you imagine like a player going oh it's a junk sheep <gasps> can't see me now but thing is you gotta breathe eventually <laughs> <laughs> if you're a caster oh you in yeah. trouble uh i want to say two more things before we can move on uh one thing is Penguin Witch Doctor posted cultural advisors. Um, well, they're they're kind of known these days mostly as sensitivity readers. They basically act kind of like editors, but they kind of go through your entire, you know, what you want published, your work, and just go, okay, uh, this could be pop. Like, basically, just highlight stuff that might end up being problematic or you know, just messed up. <laughs> That's the best yeah. way I can like, say it. Um, and also, another thing is, uh, this is on the Jung Shi. One of the things I love about this uh, creature is the fact that Paizo provided information on how to turn any creature into mm-hmm. a Jung Shi. Like, you could you could essentially even create a, what is it, a hobgoblin Jung Shi, an orc Jung Shi. Um, a, like, 
honestly, there's so many ancestries that's been released this day. Oh, a Azurketi uh, Jungshi, a Nunzi Jungshi. Like, you have a whole list you could go through here. Like, yeah. I Yeah, I definitely kind of like that, especially because, like, I like the idea that, at least as far as fantasy ancestry is concerned, um, that there shouldn't be limitation to where a, a fantasy ancestry can come from. Mm -hmm. You know, having um, uh, Tianxia dwarves, Tianxia elves, mm -hmm. Tianxia orcs, like, why not? Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't know if it's relevant to the mythology at all, but who's to say it still can't happen? You know, otherwise it gets a little muddied and gatekeepy. Yeah. I mean, imagine a lizard folk Jungshi or a hobgoblin Jungshi with their uh, reach ability. You know, that would be so Oof. cool. Uh, I'm I'm actually playing the Strength of Thousands, the Malangi Expanse mm -hmm. game, and I decided to go as a Shuni, be a Shuni bard, either Shuni bard or Shuni magus, depending if it comes out right. And so I thought, okay, well instead of being a pug dog, because that makes zero sense for the African landscape, uh, I decided to choose an African dog. So my Shuni is actually a Pasenji. Which is an adorable little guy. They're like copper coated. They can't bark because they're the larynx. Yodel. Cool. The yodel. That's right. <laughs> oh, damn it. They're going to clip that. Why do I make sound effects? <laughs> but they yodel. They're adorable. And according to mythology, so the, the one I made is a Shuni Ifrit. Because according to um, the Bantu tribe people, uh, the Basanji actually stole fire from the gods to give to man because Basanji is crazy loyal to human beings their domestication was like almost right away so they they believed because they brought the the people fire the gods punish it by making that yodel noise like you can no longer bark you're gonna make this silly sound <laughs> instead and in the percentage you're like dope we're just gonna become more adorable thank you i guess uh so percentages are dope i love them uh i think it's time for us to move on to our next creature Okay. Oh no! <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I just saw the chat. I know Shaggy. the chat. I'm like reading it too. Oh my God. I mean, you ask, you ask for it by saying, "Yeah, you don't want it getting clipped." If you, if you're literally saying you don't want it getting clipped, you're getting clipped. Oh, I know it's gonna be clipped. But as Reap Psyche saying, "Shuni Bard," is that a pun on Spoony Bard? <laughs> no, it's not. But damn it, now it is. Ugh. Oh, but... oh, that's too good. Okay, no so we're hitting the next one. The um, uh, let's see if I can get this right. Uh, Gumiho. 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 Uh, it is a CR seventeen. So far, the strongest thing we've seen. Uh, that rhymes. Uh, they are uncommon, chaotic, evil, medium, and fey. Really excited about the fey, uh, Chinese creatures. Uh, it has got a perception of twenty nine. Dark vision, scent, imprecise. 60 feet, so you're going to get more general ideas of what it can pick up and smell. It can speak common and sylvan, which, of course, is the language of the Fae. Acrobatics, plus 30. Deception, 33. Diplomacy, 33. Society, 28. And Stealth, 30. I know that's pretty common for a CR-17 creature. Still crazy to hear. Uh, strength, plus 4. Dex, plus 8. Con, plus 5. Int, plus 6. Wisdom, plus 6. Charisma, plus 9. I don't know what this is. I'm already terrified at stat block. Uh, it's got Guileful Charm. It's an emotion, enchantment, in incapacitation, mental, and occult trait ability. Any creature that converses with a Gumiho must attempt a DC 35 will save. The creature then becomes temporarily immune for 24 hours, and here's the effects. Critical success. Uh, the target is unaffected but, does, but knows the Gumiho tried to char charm it. Success, the target is unaffected. Failure, the target is affected by the failure effects of a fourth level charm spell. Critical failure, the target is affected by the failure effects of a dominate spell. And this creature has the fox marble, which if you look at the art on Archives of Nephthys, you see this cute little charm marble uh, that's green. Uh, it's got an AC of 39, fortitude 26, reflex 32, and a will of 29. It has 310 HP. It's immune to charm. But now this is interesting. I feel like this might be just because it's a fey creature. It gets a weakness to cold iron of 15. So if you are prepared for that, this fight will probably go a lot easier for you. Um, you know, cold iron's weird. It's one of those things you get access to early on, but you never use it, so then you kind of forget about it. Uh, it has a speed of 40. Uh, it's got a claw and a jaw attack. The claw is 3d8 plus 18 slashing jaw. 3d12 plus 18 piercing. 
It's it's a spellcaster. It's got a DC 38 save with attack of plus 30. By the way, if you're playing Ruby Phoenix, watch this, cheat, and get all the inside information. Uh, attack plus 30. It has a ninth level powered word kill. This thing can straight up kill you with a word. Okay, it can do it once, but once is all you need. It has an 8th level disappearance and a power word stun. has project image, warp mind, dominate, repulsion, subconscious suggestion, charm, invisibility, sleep, and thrall. And it has a ninth level cantrip of dancing lights and days. Michael Powell, I know how much you love days. Love days. Uh, it's a it's a shapeshifter. I can't wait for Eunice to give me all the deeds of this creature because this sounds super exciting. It's got a change shape ability, one action, concentrate, polymorph, occult, transmutation. The Gumiho changes into a humanoid or fox shape. Their humanoid shape has a specific persistence appearance, but their true form is their fox shape. In humanoid shape, the Gumiho uses their original size, loses their jaw strike, but retains their claw strike, and their speed is reduced to 25 feet of a human of medium size. A Gumiho is never able to completely conceal one of their nine tails through this transformation. And the sapping critical free action trigger, the Gumiho critically hits the claw or jaw strike. Effect, the Gumiho uses the fox marble to channel the life force lost by the target and to heal for half the amount of damage dealt. No limitation. Anytime you crit, this creature heals itself. Yeah. What? Okay, so this thing is this thing is busted. This thing is delightfully busted. It is powerful. It has power word kill. It can heal itself on a crit. Oh God! Yeah. Uh, please the, tell me about the fox marble. This, the, oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Well, I'll say the source of this creature is from the Pathfinder book number one six eight called King of the Mountain on page eighty one. And for players who want to do recall knowledge on more information for the creature, recall nature, fey, nature. DC of 38, and it's uh, called Fox Marble. A Gumiho wears a strange green amulet around its neck. This Fox Marble stores all the Gumiho's knowledge. By focusing on the marble, a Gumiho can perfectly recall anything it has experienced in its lifetime. A creature who manages to steal a Gumiho's Fox Marble is lucky indeed, for they can use it to access the Gumiho's memory. However, if the Gumiho still lives, the vengeful fox will stop at nothing to recover its marble. Whoever wears a fox marble gains a plus two item bonus to all checks to recall knowledge. And uh, Eunice, why don't you read our flavor text there up, up top? Okay, so Gumihos are legendary nine-tailed fox creatures who, when disguised in humanoid form, use charm and guile to lure prey deep into the forest before revealing, the, revealing their true form and striking. The green-eyed canids are, use brutally sharp fangs to tear out their victim's throat and feast on their liver. Those few who survive a gumihole's trap recall the canids' eerie green eyes, as well as a strange marble amulet worn, again, uh, worn around the monster's neck. They used to wear wrong worn. Anyways. <laughs> Old stories claim that a fox transforms into a gumiho once it has lived for a thousand years, quadruple, quadrupling its in size and growing eight additional tails, and gaining the power to change shape. Terrifyingly, it also gains an insati um, insatiable hunger for the livers of people. This hunger is so closely connected to a gumiho's power that if it abstains from eating liver for 1,000 days, the gumiho loses its magic and permanently takes on its human guise, also losing its evil nature in the process. Interesting. So it's kind of like starve out the evil mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense. Huh. Or forcing uh, someone to be good by locking a gumiho in like a locked place. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking in the chat, Reap Psyche was saying, whoa, is this like the Korean gumiho? Uh, I believe so. I did a quick, um, a quick Wikipedia check. That's about that's the as good as I'm gonna get. Uh, yeah, apparently the uh, Kumiho or Kumiho, a uh, Korean nine-tailed fox creature that appears in folk tales and legends mm -hmm. of Korea. Mm -hmm. Um, it please tell me more. I I I would love to hear more from uh from you, Eunice. I would love to hear. So I wanted to heads up that yes, the Gumiho is Korean. Gumiho is Korean. Um. 
and the uh, the character, the, the beast that they're referencing, is they take very much from the Korean uh, version of the Nine-Tailed Fox. That being said, both the Korean uh, Gumiho and the Japanese Kitsune originated from China. So the myth is originally Chinese that um, that Korea and Japan later on adopted when they were influenced by Chinese culture, which happened like a lot. It's, it's 8,000 years. How can you not? Um, and I know people are going to be like, oh my god. And I'm like, no, this is fact. Um, the reason why is because we actually have references of the nine-tailed fox in the Chinese bestiary, which was written in the Neolithic age, which is a lot older than these cultures. I'm just going to say that. It's going to be me. No. <laughs> anyways. <laughs> But anyways, but anyways, the gumi, both the gumiho and the kitsune are based on the Chinese jiu wei hu, which means a nine-tailed fox. It literally translates to nine-tailed fox. Uh, we also call uh, jiu wei hu also um, hu li jing when they're bad. Mm -hmm. And also hu yao is also an, uh, another term for fox demon. Usually hu li jing is not a good connotation. We usually call like homewreckers hu li jing. <laughs> oh my, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, Hu Yao usually refers to fox demons. So, okay, so the thing is in um, very, sim uh, so what the Gumi Hole does take influence is that um, a regular fox can become a nine-tailed fox. As long as it has cultivated itself, it actually, it has like, it cultivates energy, it cultivates like, you know, um, Oh my god, I can't remember the word right now. Ah. But um, but that's the Taoist belief. In the Taoist belief, we believe that anything can cultivate itself and become a higher being. You have a piece of rock, it can cultivate itself. You have a piece of jade, it can cultivate yourself. Like my iPhone, it can cultivate yourself. Every we believe that everything in the world has energy. Even though we can't see it, we think it's inanimate, whatever, everything has energy. And that's why in Chinese culture, we actually have a lot of like, you know weird like beasts that are from originally like or normal animals or like demons that transform from normal animals because that animal has cultivated itself enough to gain that energy and the thing is a uh, huli jing unlike the gumiho gumihos are evil i think gener like traditionally like gumihos are considered evil because they need to feed off the liver of people they they murder people um uh, Joe Hu, the nine-tailed fox, are actually kind of, they could either be good or bad. So we have two mentions of the nine-tailed fox in the Chinese bestiary. In one, where in one province, it talks about how this nine-tailed fox like copies like the sounds of crying babies and will eat men. But another province consider like will say that uh, seeing a nine-tailed fox is actually a symbol of like, it's like a good auspicious symbol. So they can be either good or bad. And okay, so I'm gonna have a, I have a couple of notes right here because it's kind of extensive. Um, so like, as I said, this Chinese bestiary was written around like in 20, 2070 BCE. So that's like 4,000 years ago. Um, and um, where's my notes? Uh, da, 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 da. And we believe that um, just like the, um, the Korean gumiho is that like the older it gets, the more tails it gets. So the tails is supposed to um, represent like how much like power they have. And the most number of course is nine tails and you only get nine tails when you have cultivated for at least a thousand years. And um, usually in the old, old um, versions of um, nine tailed um, myths, they tend to be, um, nine tailed fox actually tend to help people. They help people in need, they help people in the mountains. Um, they're not exactly vengeful. They're not exactly evil. While in um, the Korean one, you saw that they're just naturally vengeful. Mm. I don't know why. Um, most people actually don't know why how this myth uh, shifted so much when it went to um, Korea. Because even Japanese kitsunes are not always considered bad. Sometimes kitsunes help people. They're tricksters, but they won't actively want to kill people. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, and we also believe that originally they were considered beasts, but throughout the... Um, the the dynasties the myths also starts changing that yes they start become shapeshifters um that like they could become take on the form of like beautiful women and seduce men and that kind of stuff um one of uh it's really funny so in uh the end of the shang dynasty and the beginning of the zhou dynasty there was this um king he's uh king zhou of shang 
and his wife, Daji. I know about Daji. Yeah, I, I know Daji. a little bit about her. Yeah, is she? Because I've seen her epitomized as uh, a fox woman with, with many tails. Is that kind of where the idea of like uh, destructive empresses and homewreckers is attributed to the Huli Jin or the yeah, yeah. Huli Jin's a bad one, right? Huli Jin, yeah. yeah. So I actually did a video on it. I did a whole video on um, Daji and that kind of stuff because she was an actual historical uh, figure. Was she an actual fox? Most likely not. <laughs> um, actually, uh, what happened was that like um, Daji was used as a political scapegoat mm. to basically. So prior to the uh, Zhou Dynasty in Chinese culture, we weren't exactly fully patriarchal. Women were still able to have power. We, women were are not considered like oh like these horrible beings that like cr like ruin everything. But what happened with Daji was that um, the king um, was because okay. He was probably sixty something when he when he took her as a wife, and she was probably fourteen. <laughs> this happens in the olden age. It's not good, but this is what happened. And so, like, what happened was like he would have this old grandpa, who was already like near his deathbed, and suddenly he gets this like, pretty little thing that he wants to dote upon, and she's she's supposed to be really beautiful. And so that's like he's like you know super like spoils her and that kind of stuff that he neglected the kingdom. And that's what caused like all the things because he was actually not as horrible as like you know the folklore like states like says he was um but that's what happened and so when the Zhou dynasty took over they had to be like oh there has to be a reason we won't be like them we have to justify why we took over and they were like yeah you see that girl <laughs> she's a demon she ruined everything she's a fox demon oh my god but um, actually, we didn't get the whole rendition of Daji being a fox in me until the Tang, the Tang Dynasty, and the Tang Dynasty was like at least seven, eight hundred after, years afterwards. So, um, but yes, uh, so Daji is like considered like the ultimate like home record and that kind of stuff. And that's why, like, usually um, when you call someone a Huli Jing, it's not just a home record. She's so beautiful that she seduced the husbands away. And that's like, Huli Jings are always considered beautiful. So when uh, nine-tailed foxes become human, they're supposed to be like super like gorgeous, ethereal looking. It's just, oh my God, like think of like the hottest model you know, and that's like, <laughs> but like 10 times more. So what I'm hearing now is a new anime where there's like this gorgeous nine-tailed fox. You look, it's like, oh, so majestic, so ethereal. It, I wonder what they look like when they turn into a human and they turn into a very, uh, shall we say, uh, not always aesthetically a pleasing individual for that kind of like curveball the anime likes to throw people mm -hmm. and you know, all the guys are like oh no uh, but <laughs> I don't know why I just saw that happening uh, but that would be I th funny I think, I think that's really kind of an interesting story because like that's now the second mythological being that's now basically political propaganda exactly yeah, yeah. and I and I can kind of see just from what little I know about how some demons in mythology affect people where it's like, oh, that's why our empire was weak because a demon came in when they were old and soft and they mm -hmm. knew that if they could just, you know, distract them until their deathbed, we'd be too weak to fight this other power that's taking us over. When meanwhile, it's like, no, the guy just loved her. And what the hell is she going to do? She's like 15 and she's like, yeah. uh, it's this or death. So I guess it's this. Yeah. I don't know. She, and the thing is, she was actually a political, tr she was a trophy. So legit, like the king took over this area. And then like her dad was like, please don't kill us. Here, take my daughter. Marry her. Do whatever you want to her. That was what, this poor girl basically became like a trophy. She became an object. And then like now, like she's still demonized to this day. Like every depiction you see of Daji, it's all like an evil, malevolent, like, you know, fox spirit that was like murdering people, like cutting pregnant women, like stomachs open, c pulling out like the heart of like the advisors. And it's unfortunate. And then, yeah. as I said, like, this didn't start until like later on. Like yeah. the depiction of the nine-tailed foxes weren't evil. Yeah, you have one that ate like people. Yeah, sure. But they weren't like actively like being like, oh my God, I'm going to destroy you all, that kind of stuff. Yeah. See, that's really cool to know and learn because, like, I know, I know of only like a few uh, 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 people, uh, women in power in, in Chinese history. Like, I want to say there was one, this was like in the 60s, I think it was during like uh, the, the, the communist uh, uh, dictatorship. Are you talking about Mao Zedong's wife? Yes. You know what I'm talking about. With the, with, I think she referred to it as like a Buddhist barbecue when in protest they lit themselves on fire. But I don't know that's another scapegoat tactic. Like, I don't know any more 
like what's real and what's yeah. a really bad also, twist. Also, I want to throw in the Empress Dowager into the whole. Mix. Oh my God, yeah. that woman! Ah! Please, I want to hear the story, uh, and then we'll go to the next no. monster. The okay, creature. so okay, there are okay, there are amazing women in history, and there are horrible, hated women in history. I'm not gonna do the more recent ones because that's a whole, whole lot of political thing that I don't want to dip into. But with mm. Sushi, oh my God, I hate this woman so much. I've never hated anyone so much in my life. Ah! <laughs> How strongly I feel because okay, you have a lot of pe women that were scapegoated in Chinese culture. Uh, uh, Xi Shi, Da Ji, uh, Chen Yuan, Yang Guifei. Those are all like women that were consorts. They were like wives of emperors who were horrible, but they were blamed for like you know the fall of the dynasty. You have actually amazing women like uh, Wu Zetian, which was the only female emperor in Chinese history. But like she actually brought the Tang Dynasty up to amazing. Like she, the the like economy was booming during her reign. But then later on, people are like, oh no, she killed people. Oh my god, ah, oh, she's a horrible emperor. Oh my god. Yeah, she's. No, they, she... they blame her for killing people, but the male counterparts did the same thing. Exactly. Yeah, you they, show me one empire that didn't colonize and kill its right? own people, and I'll show you a liar. Yeah, and then, like, they're like, oh, my gosh, she killed her own daughter in order to, like, but it's, like, babies died all the time during Back that time. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah, babies, still yeah, babies still technically die now. It's unfortunate, but, you know, babies are fragile. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah, but anyways, but, oh, my God. <sighs> Sushi? Mm -hmm. Sushi? Okay, so... Let's start with who Chu Sushi was. She was I know. Um I don't Sushi, I don't have a fan. Uh, I forgot who Sushi's husband was. I, I, I do have don't... a fan. Get a piece of paper, just fold it like multiple yeah. times. No no no. I'm using I'm using the, the partner's fan. Let's Here we see, go. Who was her Yes? I love fans. Okay. She loves who, elephants, so who, who was her husband? Uh Xianfeng Xianfeng. Okay. So Xianfeng. Um so Towards the end of the Qing Dynasty, things are already happening. Uh, beginning Qing Dynasty was great. You had, um, uh, yeah, Kangxi was basically the start of the base. Kangxi was good. Um, then it was Yongzhen, uh, Qianlong, Jiaqing, uh, Daoguang, and whatever, until Xianfeng. She was the uh, one of the consorts of Emperor Xianfeng. This was probably like three dynast three emperors before the end of the Qing Dynasty. So. She was just a consort. She wasn't anyone special. She wasn't anyone like, you know, um, she wasn't a super high like level consort at all. She was just a regular like, I think she was like a ping or something like that. Anyways, but then what happened was that like she bore like, like, like the only son that like, um, that like was favored by, I remember she bore like the only son that was favored by like the emperor. And when he died, her son became emperor. And that's why she became like from like a lowly thing suddenly to becoming like the dowager, dowager, dowager. But then what happened is that like, you know, she like her son died. There was no more heir. Her son died really young. So what did she do? She took her sister's son, uh, which was Guangxu. And she freaking like abused that kid. It was so sad. He was supposed to be the emperor. Like he took, um, basically he took, uh, she took him from her sister when he was only like four years old. And tried to like basically was like you know oh yeah he's gonna be the emperor you should be happy but she was basically the one behind the screen she was the one controlling everything this poor kid was starving like he was stealing buns from the eunuchs and then they were he was getting beat up all the time by the eunuchs he control she controlled his life like crazy she controlled like who he like he wasn't allowed a wife until later on and she was the one that like chose his wife and the wife, his wife, of course, like, you know, incest was like a huge thing back then, but the wife was like his cousin. And I'm sorry, but she was really not good looking. But the reason why, because usually like, like you think the old people like times didn't look good. She was really not good looking. But the reason why she, ch uh, the sushi so chose this lady mm -hmm. is because she listens. She's really oh. obedient. And of course, like Guangxu was like, WTF. But you know what? I'll do it. And then like later on, he he like fell in love with this um another one of his consorts. And when they were running, so what happened? Like he really like he really really like spoiled her. He loved her. She was really beauty. She was really beautiful. Um, she, we actually have photos of her now because during that dynasty, we actually started having photographs. She was called um. 
I forgot her name. <laughs> uh, 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 Jin Fei, uh, her name was Jin Fei. So what happened was that when they were leaving the Beijing Palace because, you know, the English people were coming in, she told Jin Fei, like, oh, we, we can't take you. But if we leave you here, you might get assaulted. And that's a shame on us if you get assaulted. It's a shame on the royal family. So I'm going to stuff you down the well. <laughs> the well is this big. I've seen the well. She, they stuffed her into the well, and that's how she died. Jesus. This wow. lady was horrible. She was controlling. She wanted to become the next Wu Zetian, but she wasn't as smart as Wu Zetian. And, like, um, she is actually accredited with the fall of the Qing Dynasty. She is that bad. Um, when the Westerners came to try to get, like, do a treaty with her, she's like, huh, the only time I work with you is when, like, candles are, like, when, like, candles can, like, be lit upside down. Isn't that what light bulbs are? Yeah, I was gonna say they, they can. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, like mm. it's like she had this whole hubris, like, oh my god, you can't do anything to me. I am the best, and da 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 da. So yeah, so she was the reason, and then like she actually poisoned that when she she knew it was going to die. So what did she do? Um, it said that she poisoned that emperor Guangxu the day before he like the, uh, the day before she died. So once he died, she died the next day. She's probably like, oh, man, my protection is gone. I better dip out on my own terms. Poison, yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. Oof. she killed him. No, she killed him first. Oh. She killed and him, and then she yeah. died the next day of old age. It, yeah, it sounds more like a spike killing. She's yeah. just a horrible person. Like, no joke, I've never hated any, like, historical figure this much in my life. It's like... Uh, she's she's definitely like an ego t uh, an ego tyrant oh, yeah. to the she highest is, she's degree. Narcissist, like all that stuff. She has all of that stuff. It's she was just horrible. Yeah. And also, and failure O four is like I remember the tale of Judd Fay. So yeah, it's <laughs> oof, it's prolific. But but sounds like a good inspiration for a villain if you need one. She, I mean, yeah. You, she is the ultimate historical villain. I, I think only one person I could think of in history was during the Han Dynasty that was pretty bad too, but no. So she was, she had no right to be that evil. She, just, right. she just had the will to be evil. Uh, um, next up on the yeah. list of, we're doing another monster, right, Mike? Yes, yes, yes. I was going to say, uh, yeah, I think let's uh, jump onto our next one. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we got the, uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong. Um, Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu. San Zhu San Zhu Wu San Zhu Wu San Zhu Wu So San first tone Zhu second turn tone and then Wu first tone so San Zhu Wu San Zhu Wu Yes it's okay San Zhu Oh with that San 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 It's okay just go San Zhu San Zhu San Sanzu, woo. Just go right. Sanzu. <laughs> uh, I want it's to apologize hard. on behalf it's of hard. all of these people. All right. uh, butchering this beautiful language, I apologize. Um, Sanzu, uh, perception 26. Now, by the way, this is uh, from the image. Uh, I'm sure I'll get corrected on this. I'm looking forward to it because I want to know what this is. It kind of gives me like a... a a phoenix vibe or like a uh, ho -Oh from the po no moltres from the pokemon like a bird that has fire but may not be fire yeah um we'll, 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 let's explore we'll explore yeah, we'll explore yeah, yeah. correct correct me later correct me later yeah. and, and by that i mean you please correct me uh <laughs> it is an uncommon true neutral that's right like the, the, what i find interesting about this it's a true neutral tiny Beast of Fire. It's a bird of fire. Uh, it's got. It's a CR 15 creature. Perception 26 with greater dark vision. So I believe that means it can see through magical dark vision. Uh, it has. Uh, it speaks common. It's also telepathic out to 100 feet. So it can just talk to your mind directly in whatever language or thing that your mind uh, communicates with. It has an acrobatics of plus 30, athletics of 27, and diplomacy of 25. Strength 4, Dex 8, Con 6, Intelligence 4, Wisdom 5, Charisma 4. Solid block. Clearly this is a, a agile, an agile creature. Has 36 armor class, Fortitude 26, Reflex 29, Will 23. Again, fast burb. Uh, it's got 295 HP, not quite 300. It's immune to fire and light. Um, so 
don't bring your fire sorcerer to this. It's not going to do much. But weakness, a little weakness here. It does have a cold 15 weakness. If you got Polar Ray at level 15, which I believe you should have it, fire that bad boy up. Golden Sun is one of its abilities. It is an Abjuration Aura Primal. It is an aura of 10 feet. A golden aura envelops the creature, protecting them from weak magic. Any non-cold spells, third level or lower, burn away and are ineffective. A Sanzu can deactivate or activate the golden aura as a free action with the concentration trait. So the minute you get into a fight, guys, really make sure you've, you've saved your, your stronger spells. Otherwise, you're not going to actually do anything to this guy at all. Scorching Gaze Reaction. It's an Evocation Fire Primal trait. The trigger, any creature within 30 feet targets the Sanzu, Sanzu uh, or one of their allies with a weapon attack. Effect, the creature focuses their gaze on the triggering creature's weapon, heating it to a burning temperature for an instant. The creature takes 4d8 fire damage unless the creature releases the weapon as a free action. So as a reaction, they can immediately cast Heat Metal, making the weapon almost kill you if you hold on for too long. Uh, but it's only, it's only for one round. Yeah. Uh, they, have a, they have a walking speed of 25, but a fly speed of 60 feet. They're fast. Um, they have two melee strikes, uh, a beak, which is 3d6 plus 14 plus 3d6 fire damage, and they have a talon, which is 3d6, uh, I'm sorry, 3d4, plus 14 piercing damage, plus 3d6 fire. So these things are pretty gnarly. Lots of fire damage. Make sure you're prepared for that. Fiery transformation. It's two actions. Concentration, fire, polymorph, primal, transmutation traits. Uh, the bird transforms into an enormous bird made of flame. As the uh, Sunzu begins their transformation, creatures with a 10-foot emanation take 68 fire damage. Basic uh, reflex save of DC 33. So that could double to 12d8 if you're not careful. Uh, while in their, tr in their flame form, uh, the creature gains the effects of a fourth level enlarge. They can use fiery transformation again to revert back to their standard form. So this thing is definitely boss potential. It can definitely get large, buff itself up, and hurt you a lot. Uh, it has radiant blast. Um, they produce a bead of burning energy, hurling it to point in 200 feet. The bead detonates, dealing 7d8 fire damage and 4d10 sonic damage to all creatures in a 30-foot burst basic reflex save of DC 33, which on a critical fail would double both of those damages. Creatures that critically fail become blinded for one round also. They can use this once every 1d4 rounds. They're basically shooting off um, a, the, the world's worst version of fireball because that sonic damage is almost impossible to become resistant against. Um, scorched Earth, two actions. Uh the ground that this creature stands on. Yet basically, yet you can't be flying and use this. Uh, effect, the Sanzuwu, Sa Sanzuwu strides, I'll get it right one of these days, a sixth level wall of fire appears in the spaces that they left during their walking movement, lasting for one round. You cannot use this again for 1d4 rounds. You're literally creating wall of fire for free. Uh, transfixing Sunbeam. While you're in the fiery form, you spread your wings, emitting a bright cascade of light in a 30-foot cone. This requires a DC 33 fortitude save. Success, nothing happens. Failure, stunned one. Critical failure, stunned two. That wraps up the mechanics. It's a lot, but this thing, it has basically a bunch of very powerful spells as normal attacks that they can just keep refreshing and reusing. That is terrifying. Yeah. Uh, also, the source for uh, this creature is in the Pathfinder number 168, King of the Mountain Book, part of the Fist of the Ruby Phoenix Adventure Path on page 85. And for players who want to do a recall knowledge beast check, uh, Arcana in Nature is a DC of 36. And uh, let's see, it's uh, called a Fiery Murder. Hmm. When several Sun Wuzu, Sun Wu's are together the immense heat radiating from them can cause an inferno of devastation. Legends tell of Sang Wu Wu uh, gathered together as the ground rends into volcanic rifts and uncontrollable blazes. 
Though they bring destructions in their wake, some stories claim that a brave individual who can follow these cataclysmic rifts for 10 days will reach the sun and earn its blessings. Please tell, please correct me if this is inappropriate, but that sounds like a Pokedex reading for a Pokemon. A, a little bit, a it, little bit. So I'm not the only one. Okay, thank yeah, you. I was, I yeah, was like, a little bit. I mean, that sounds like Pokemon Sun and Moon. Like these birds, while mm -hmm. nice, can make eruption fires. Some rumors say that if you follow them, you will get a blessing, and it's like, that's a Pokedex. Yeah. That's, Andrea, a, that's swear definitely to God. a Pokedex. Yeah. And speaking of which, um, Eunice, why don't you read the flavor on top? Okay. Those who feast on the sun are said to carry its power within them. Sanzu are small crows with red plumage and dark throats. According to legend, they stole their burning power from the sun and now fly ac across the sky as blinding streaks of fire. When they land on the earth, it ignites around them, causing unbound destruction. A handful of people worship these radiant birds and inscribe their three-legged vis visage on coins, items, and weapons. These things do sound like badasses, if I'm being honest. Like, we eat the sun, and when we land, the earth is rent in fire. Yes. For, do you know how metal you are? I'm very metal. Put me on your swords. Right now, yes, I will do that, of course. For, and it burns the sword. Yeah. <laughs> and it burns the sword. Yeah. Like, you melted my sword. You're too metal for my metal. What the hell? For uh, those of you who um, follow the, the Pathfinder 2nd Edition uh, games and uh, such, uh, the mythology, it also sounds a lot like the whole Tengu origin story or mm. mythos where they stole part of the sun and that's why they can't fly or and stuff like that i know generally and again i don't know everything but i, I remember somewhere in the greater pop culture of like video games and anime and movies and something they're also attributed to the wind is mm -hmm. uh, tengus i mean is that like a like another story about them or is it part of their origin uh if i remember correctly tengus they have like a fan that can mm -hmm. like fan yeah away. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, uh, PJ, uh, Reap Psyche also agrees. I think that's literally uh, ho oh. I'm not the only one. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, Penguin Witch Doctor is also asking Is there a way to cast cantrips as a free action? Because Ray of Frost would do a minimum of 16 points to this. Ooh, as a free action. Uh... I think there's a feat that might do that or. I want to say there's an ability. It's definitely a later game ability because mm -hmm. to be able to cast a cantrip as a free action is yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I don't know about free action, but there's definitely abilities that let you cast it as a single cost action as opposed to a two cost action. Yeah. So, uh, Eunice, um, if you don't mind, uh, drop us some of that uh, educational, uh, you know, cultural knowledge on us. Please. Okay, so again, oh my god, I'm just like, okay, I got this. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm like an old Asian grandpa, just a heads up. <laughs> um, so again, like uh, the Ninetale Fox, um, like the, um, the Quinn and the Pong, it's another ancient beast. Uh, so it's quite interesting. So you can actually find uh, depictions of San Zhu Wu in, um, on pottery and all that stuff as early as the Neolithic age, which is like the Xia Dynasty. Um, San, uh, San Zhu Wu literally translates to three-legged crows. So these crows have three legs. And um, so again, this is another, this, uh, San Zhu Wu also have a huge interesting part in our uh, Chinese actual like mythology it's like one of the like create not creation mythology but like it's 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 mythos anyways um so um you guys know Chang'e right the goddess of the moon Chang'e no eh. hello no, okay so she has a husband named Ho Yi Ho Yi was like the best archer in the world so mm -hmm. okay yeah. so I know that there, one. okay cool so the one of the major myths that uh, you see San Zhu Wu in is the um, the ten suns. So which is why, like when I saw the ten days, I was like, ah, ten. Ah. <laughs> they did the research. 
they did research. <laughs> um, I just want to say, like, no joke. Like, they did a lot of their research. Like, from the Chinese ones, like, they even included, like, a lot of mythology, like, beasts that are not really well known. Yeah. yeah and they did yeah. very well with this. So, I'm, like, looking at this, just, like, right now, just, like, what we have discussed. This is quite yeah. well researched. I, I also want to add that uh, because uh, Eunice and I, we actually went through uh, the creature, mm -hmm. uh, creatures that's been presented in these three books. And not just Chinese creatures, but they've uh, included really, like, you know, creatures from uh, Filipino folklore, um, uh, Korea, Korean, you know, uh, Japanese. Japanese. So they, they, they really do, do do their homework over there at Paizo. Yeah. yeah, like, I was, like, blown away when I was doing research for today. I was mm -hmm. like, wow, like, oh, my gosh. They did very, very well with mm -hmm. their research, just putting as a heads up. But anyways, so... Um, the legend of the ten, the myth of the ten sons is that like we have in our heavens we have certain um we have certain uh, gods so we have Dijun and Shihe. Shihe is known as the mother of the sons. So basically, Dijun and Shihe had ten sons, that were sons. So mm -hmm. ten sons, sons. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I know ten sons, sons. So anyway, so they had ten sons, and every morning she would actually um wake one of her sons. And take him on her dragon drawn carriage and drive across the sky and that is supposed to explain the rising and setting of the sun so every day is a different sun mm -hmm. sun <laughs> um, <laughs> until one day like all the sun suns decided that like hey why don't we all like go up together like we, why do where is it only one at a time that's not that's why so they decided like um while their parents are sleeping they snuck to the heavens and they're like this is so much fun oh my god we oh my god sorry that's just basically it so i just love just... the idea these kids are like mom and dad aren't home let's go play in the sky yeah I, I also yeah i also want to add that uh the chinese we really really like our puns and wordplay but then the sun sun doesn't work in yeah. Mandarin, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, Chinese humor. Oh, no, we general. love wordplay. Like, oh, my God, it's the best thing. Like, a lot of the reasons things we don't do things is because it sounds too much like death or that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Anyways, anyways. Um, so they're just running around. But now you have, like, ten suns in the sky. Mm -hmm. It completely burned and scorched the sky. Um, they scorched the earth. Like, rivers dried up. Like, the crowds are cracking. People were dying. They were getting, like, heat stroke and just mm -hmm. dropping, like, flies. And so DJ, their dad, was all like, sons, come down. Like, we gotta go. Come down. Like, you're killing people. They're like, no, we're having too much fun. And they refused to come down. So DJ was like, okay, you know what? This is, this is your fault. So he called upon the, the land's best archer, which is Ho Yi, to shoot his sons down. Because they wouldn't come down. They're like, you know what? Okay, cool. We're going to shoot you down. So when Ho and Ho Yi being like the best um, archer in the world, they're all like, okay, cool. So every, every son that he shot down, when they fell to the earth, they fell in the form of crows. So each son became a crow until finally there was only one sun in the sky, which is the sun we have now. Mm -hmm. So that's the associated with ten and crows and scorching the earth. Um, but there's also other depictions of the Sanzu Wu in other uh, things as well. Uh, uh, Fu, was it? Let me see the tone just to make sure I'm not pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Fushi, yeah, Fushi. Fushi um, is one of our creation gods. Fushi and Yuwa are credited with the creation of the world. Uh, Fushi is um, like associated with the sun, while Yuwa is associated with the moon. And uh, Fushi is also said to be like holding like a. Um, like a dish like a sun dish and on it is also a three-legged crow um you can also find depictions of the three-legged bird called san zunyao in also the chinese bestiary <laughs> again everything like no joke you want a good a um beast and like no one knows just go through this this has like all of our like beasts on here that was created like yeah Anyways, um, so uh, let's see. So let me see what was the one I wrote on it. So uh, the San Zunyao is also found in the Chinese bestiary. And um, they're said to be like the messengers of the Queen of the West, the mo Queen Mother of the West, Shi Wanglu, which is another major goddess in our pantheon. Um, they're said to be her, um, be her messengers. And even though it doesn't say that they're crows, it's kind of agreed upon that they're crows. <laughs> but yeah. 
And then, I have, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I have a, a, a dumb question, uh, mm -hmm. an ignorant question, I should say. Um, so the, 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 these fire birds or the crows that represent the, the, the sun mm -hmm. went, to the, went to the queen in the west. Is there any connection between this story and the feng shui directional beast of the West being, in Japanese mythology anyway, Suzaku, the firebird? Um, it might be because remember, uh, I, again, I'm going to probably be pissing a lot of people off. A lot of Japanese of their folklore and that kind of stuff has been inspired by uh, Chinese mythos. Um, a lot of the modern uh, Japanese culture now, like the kimono and that kind of stuff, is all from the Tang Dynasty. A lot of their mythos is from the Tang Dynasty. Like, uh, know how Tanabata just passed for Japan? T Tanabata is actually based on one of our. Um, it's based on one of our uh, holidays, which is Chishi, which is basically you know when um, like Niu Lang Junyu, like the cowherd and the weaver girl, are met across like a. Uh, a flock of magpies. So a lot of Japanese culture actually, like a lot of their mythos do take from Chinese culture. So yes, I believe so. Just like how Tengu, Tengu is actually based on uh, Tiengo, which is actually a dog. People are like, how did Tengus become a dog to like a crow thing in Japanese culture? We actually don't know. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, ten Tengus are actually still written as Tiengo, which means heaven dog. It's interesting. Heck yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, hey, the Greeks and the Romans did it. Yeah, I you know of course yeah. other other cultures are bound to to borrow and mm -hmm. you know take. Yeah, uh, but that's really fascinating. Thank you so much. So this is you know like these suns that were shot down and uh, the the bird that's on the sun disc of Fuji. I do remember Fuji a little bit, but again, guilty uh, uh, mittens. I only know Fuji because he was in Dynasty Warriors three. <laughs> And it's lame, but I will own no, it to my fine. lameness. I, no, that's, that's how, that's how I, I learned I about it. I actually really like that. It actually, these kind of stuff, even though maybe not be the most accurate depiction of these figures, um, still, like, at least educate people. They actually get people to, like, oh, they're yeah. like, oh, what is this? And then they'll be like, oh, later on, I was like, oh, I know this. Like, that, I think that's... Yeah, like, I, I, don't, I don't really believe Juge Leong uh, shot laser beams out of a fan, but it was fun to see in the video game. Yes, yeah. it was. Let me tell you. Did you watch uh, the movie? Did you watch the movie? No, I want to. It looks so. Well, it looks interesting to say the least. I'm so excited about it. But, it's uh, only good. Uh, just like a heads up. It's no Zuko Liang. It's before everything happens. It's oh, like, so it's like it's like cool. just before the Yellow Turban Rebellion or it's, in uh, the Yellow Turban Rebellion. It's basically uh, Yellow Turban Rebellion starts the movie and mm. then the movie ends when um, they kind of go into the capital, but. Um, uh, Dong, 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 oh, I forgot, I forgot his name, Dong, Dong Zhuo. Dong Zhuo, thank you, thank you, Dong Zhuo. Dong Zhuo hasn't died yet. Lu Bu hasn't mm. died yet. Uh, so we're just before uh, the second rebellion, the mm -hmm. uh, Dong Zhuo's rebellion, basically. Yeah, so basically, okay. yeah, it ends with, uh, it's, uh, it's not Chibi, it's not Chibi, it's, oh, I forgot which battle it was. Anyways, uh. yeah. So yeah, it's like, it's like the beginning, and it's implied that there's going to be more movies later on. So awesome. Oh my god, well, well, Boy, you're so hot. <laughs> well, speaking <laughs> of, um, you know, inspirations and everything like that, uh, our, let's jump over to our last and final uh, creature here that we're going to be discussing, the spirit turtle. Ah, spirit turtle, all right. Well, let's do this, and then after this, we will have to call it, because it is getting mm -hmm. yeah. to be that time. Yep, yep. Um, that I actually closed the link, because I was like, oh, we're just going to wrap up. No, we have time. We're going to knock it out. Just give me a second to get it back. All right, Spirit Turtle, this is a CR-21 creature. And for sure, when I saw this, I was thinking either Torterra from Pokemon or um, definitely, uh, uh, you know, um, oh gosh. Avatar? Genbu oh. from, well, mm -hmm. Avatar, but I was thinking uh, Genbu from uh, uh, the, the Four Directions again. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, moving on. So the Spirit Turtle is a rare, chaotic, good, gargantuan fey creature. Uh, Perception 35, you can find this creature in the King of the Mountain, page 86. Uh, they speak uh, common, sylvan, and I believe they benefit from the tongues spell ability. Either way, they actually have a diplomacy of 36, lore of 34, everything. Medicine 40, nature 36, occultism 34, survival 40. This thing is more cleric than your cleric, more druid than your druid. Um, plus 8 to strength, dex 6, con 11, intelligence 6, wisdom 10, charisma 7. Now, I'm shocked just because those are some bonker numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, has an AC of 45, a fortitude save of plus 40. 
Reflex, plus 32. Will, plus 38. Uh, it has 320 HP with a regeneration of 25, which is deactivated by a cold iron or evil type damage. It has resistance to fire of 20 and physical of 15, but its weakness is cold iron 20. So if you really want to hurt this thing, bring out your fey killers. It has a pacifying aura of 100 feet, uh, which means that a spirit turtle exudes a consistent feeling of calm. Creatures within the aura are subjected to a 10th level calm emotion spell of a DC 44 will save. Holy moly. The effects persist up to one hour, even if the creature leaves the aura. Regardless of the result of the saving throw, the creature is temporarily immune for one hour. That is, that is insane. A 10th level spell aura. All the time. Yeah. And with 100 feet. My God. Um, it has a speed of 30 feet with a swim of 40 feet. It has two attacks. It has a job. A jaw bite, which does 40, 12, plus 14 piercing, plus 2d6 energy, and improved grab. Does not say what that energy damage is. Uh, and the foot, it can stomp you with its foot, uh, has 40, 10, plus 14 bludgeoning, plus 2d6 energy in improvised, I'm sorry, an improved knockdown. It has a reach of 20 for its jaw and a reach of 15 for its feet. This thing is, this thing's... It's, it's a monster. It's like, I'm going to attack you from 20 feet away, mm -hmm. and if you want to come near me, you're going to be super chill for at least an hour. Um, primal innate spells, this thing is a, a, basically a druid. It has a 10th level primal phenomenon or revival. So it's either going to cause all of nature to attack you and implode, or it's going to bring you back from the dead. Uh, it has field of life at 9th level, movement of renewal, Sorry, moment of renewal. It gets two moments of renewals, two fields of lives, a plane shift, self only, regenerate. It's got two regenerate spells. It has two restoration spells, three breaths of lives. Uh, it has a fourth level heal at will. At will, it can do a fourth level healing spell. Vital beacon at will. And it's constantly under the effect of a 10th level tongues spell. This thing is statted out of the... This thing is like, you, you're never going to kill it through physical damage because it's going to heal or just resurrect or... It, it's insane. It has a constrict ability. One action. Does 4d12 plus 7 bludgeoning damage with a DC of 41. So you better be strong. The environmental balance is a free action. I'm sorry. It's a free action. It's a reaction. Or it's a free action based off something. That's what I'm looking for. The spirit turtle begins their turn. When it begins its turn, the spirit turtle harnesses their connection with the world around them to augment their attacks. Okay, this is what the energy is. Basically, every time you start your turn, you get to choose what energy your melee attacks are going to do. Uh, they can be cold, electricity, or fire. The energy damage dealt by the strikes and unbalancing stomp changes to that energy type. What is unbalancing stomp, you ask? I'm glad you did. It's a two-action attack. Spirit Turtle makes a foot strike with that big turtle foot. Whether or not the strike hits, the stomp creates a shockwave on the ground and a 15-foot burst centered on the target. All creatures in the area other than the Spirit Turtle take 10d10 bludgeoning damage, so almost 100 damage, and 4d8 energy damage, so about 32 bonus damage on that, and are knocked prone. This comes with a DC 41 basic reflex save, meaning all of that can be doubled to 266, 64 mm -hmm. damage in an area of 15 feet in, like, outside of the, of the damage. Creatures that critically succeed on the reflex save are not knocked prone. The spirit turtle cannot use it for another 1d4 rounds, which means if you roll well enough, you could be doing this unbalancing stomp every other turn. Yeah. With your 320 HP regeneration of 25 and constant level 4 heals and level 9 resurrection spells, this is not a fight yeah. you want to take, guys. This is not a good fight at all. It's GMs. A, it's a dude. bonkers AoE attack. It's a it's, really... Ooh. This thing is insane. I'm sorry to yeah. overtalk you. No, it's, oh, my God. Yeah. Oh. Um, like, as PJ said earlier, the source for this is Pathfinder 168. Uh, title of the book is called King of the Mountain, part of the 
Fist of the Ruby Phoenix Adventure Path on page 86. And for players who want to do a recall knowledge check, it's Recall Knowledge Fey Nature with a DC of 47. It's called Spiritual Task, and most spirit turtles grant an extended lifetime as a gift for completing an important task. The requirements of a task may vary from turtle to turtle, but they are always massive undertakings. In one part of the saga of Ar Artomos the tailor, uh, Artomos met with a spirit turtle and earned their favor by sewing a quilt as massive as a lake um, in which the turtle slept. The quilt required cloth from the robes of each ruler in Tianxian, uh, but Artomos' uh, efforts eventually earned him a golden needle to aid him in his journey. And this is not the gold needle in Final Fantasy that breaks um, uh, petrification. Yeah, I don't believe. I think it's a bigger deal than that. But this is yeah. still awesome. Like this is this is a this is a, a quest giver NPC that if you yeah. decide to get all like rowdy and try to fight him, he's gonna be like, no, 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 stop, stomp, mm -hmm. you're dead. Yeah, uh, Eunice, why don't you take the flavor text for us? Okay, spirit turtles are benevolent fae known to heal those in need and confer other powerful gifts. These gentle giants resemble enormous turtles and often bear entire ecosystems on their shell. In ancient times, so the legend goes, spirit turtles used to grant wishes to any mortals. After millennia of such encounters, the giant creature grew tired and went into hiding or returned to their once home plane, the first world. Those few spirit turtles who remain on Gal Galarian now grant their favors only to the purest and worthiest and worthiest mortal petitioners so uh yeah like as pj said earlier these are your these are honestly essentially your quest givers i wouldn't say you know you'd be hunting uh the spirit turtles down unless you're playing like a really evil campaign Yo, yeah turtle, turtle soup oh god <laughs> it's like it's like a futurama it's like, we got to stop polluting because we're ruining the, the planet and, and hurting all the turtles. Screw oh. the turtles. Who said that? <laughs> I, I just thought of a really cool um, game idea. Basically, you have to visit four spirit turtles. And each of them are represented by a color. Red, oh, no. orange, <laughs> blue, and purple. See, I'm here for this. If for <laughs> nothing else, then each turtle has a theme task. The blue turtle's like... You must show me that you are a leader and you are and you are wise and patient. And the red one's like, you must show me that you take no crap from anybody. And <laughs> at that person, you're gonna beat them up in a fight. And then the the orange one's like, bruh, listen, bruh, okay, so chill vibes only. We need to like get some za. We need to get some sodas and just have a party, dude. And the purple one like, you know Murder. what? Let <laughs> No, no, the purple would be, let's build something. I don't think yeah. Donatello would advocate murder. Just, just Donatello would be like, let's do machines. Yeah, no, let's do said. murder let's machines. Do, let's do murder machines. Now, <laughs> battle bots. Donatello, Spirit Turtle, wants you to make battle bots. But yeah, um, yeah, Eunice, why don't you give us some uh, kind of the cultural folklore backgrounds on these uh, Spirit Turtles? murder turtles <laughs> <laughs> they are they're gargantuan chaotic good murder turtles myrtles oh my god, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. okay before i go i saw like witch doctor uh penguin witch doctor says he wants to okay in uh in yonjo in yonjo that's how mm. i pronounce i'm not mm. korean though but google translate in yonjo <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was gonna bring that to your attention. I'm so glad you got that. Yeah, in in Yonjo. In in Yonjo. In in Anyways, okay, so turtles are like again, um like one of the it's like a really important like uh beast again in Chinese culture. One of our um one of our directional guardians, I believe it is let's see, what was it? Ah, oh, okay, here we go. The uh, the guardian of the north is the black tortoise, mm -hmm. and it's uh the element is water. So like uh the black tortoise is like super important because along with like the white tiger, the um other stuff. The <laughs> phoenix dragon. and the dragon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there, thank you. And then the chiling is supposed to be like the central. Like it's the, it's the guardian of the north. And mm -hmm. the thing about the black tortoise is like even though it's a tortoise. 
sometimes like you see a depiction of a snake with the turtle but mm. it's actually one beast the reason why it's uh the turtle is supposed to have like a super long neck that's supposed like a lot of people like miss uh translate from ancient texts into like a snake and a tortoise but it's actually a tortoise mm. with a very long neck um so that's actually a very important so the oldest um depiction of the um and it's also the uh the black tortoise called uh uh let's see let me see uh uh zim uh zim uh zim ming zim ming zim ming thank you uh zim ming and um the oldest depiction of this uh tortoise was found around 500 and 5300 bce so it's super super old this depiction of this animal is super old um that's only one of the tortoises uh, and because tortoises are live so long and whatever they're a good symbol of longevity and that kind of stuff and patience in chinese culture another um version of a tortoise that i felt like this this tortoise was inspired by is um i'll um i'm gonna be saying that there's gonna be talking about decapitation just heads up <laughs> Heads up. Okay. Okay. So, um, in so the tortoise is actually really important in our creation myth. Remember when I said like uh, Fushi and Yuwa were like the creation gods. Mm -hmm. So what happened? There's like a very famous uh, myth called Nuwa Bu Tian, which translates to like Nuwa patches the sky, and that's like um, super and super important myth in our Chinese culture. It's also really important in a lot of folklore because a lot of our folklore stems from like Nuwa Bu Tian, like as the first like thing anyways so what happened was that when the four pillars that were supporting the heavens like from the earth started to crumble she had to find a way to patch it to like find pillars to like support it so she cut off the four legs of a tortoise <laughs> and used the legs to support this heaven so now we believe that tortoise legs are the ones supporting the heaven from crashing to the earth nice um some myth says that owl died, but other myths that actually owl um, survived. Um, it is said that owl actually lives in the uh, Bohai Sea, which is like in somewhere in China, and carries the um, the three islands of the eight immortals on its back. So basically, it's very similar to the world turtle myths. Mm -hmm. A lot of other culture has world turtle myths. You see, like you know, whole like I think like, I forgot which culture has it that um, like our world is actually on the back of a tortoise. I forgot which culture I, it was, but yeah. I do know in popular media they uh, they use uh, let's see, Terry Pratchett books. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the whole you know the giant turtle that has the elephants on its back that then has mm -hmm. the disc world on their trunks, yeah. their head, their backs, and then there's also uh, what is it? Uh, Stephen King's uh, you know Dark Tower universe where you know there's the turtle gone. You know, with those in, uh, you know, that, but that's popular, you know, culture. There's something wanna... like a turtle in it, too. Yeah. I want to say, and I'm sure someone can correct me on this, but I want to say the turtle is similar in Norse mythology. I don't think it's like, I don't think it's in the, the world creation, because obviously you have the world tree and you have, mm -hmm. you know, all the different realms. But mm -hmm. I want to say uh, something about the turtle comes into play, at least with Freya. Ah, it's been forever. Um, and that's the thing about the Edda, like, I'm only hearing stories from stories. I, I haven't had a chance to sit down and read the whole thing yet. Um, yeah, Penguin Witch Doctor was like, Discworld! Uh, Andrew Psaki says, uh, I don't think it's supposed to be Charlie, but my brain wants to read that as Charlie, Reeve Psyche. Uh, anyway, so yeah, that, that's really fascinating about the spirit turtle. So it's kind of like this, um powerful holdover from the creation of the world and it mm -hmm. would make sense because this guy is a fae so he's definitely like a, like a fairy or a, mm -hmm. a powerful spirit he's very very hard to kill mm -hmm. by these stats dear god and all of his magic seemed to be about um creating life keeping life going keeping mm -hmm. things from you know staying dead if they are killed or preventing death if it occurs and then of course everything else is just I'm a big turtle, so stomp, stomp, stomp. That's, I, I mean, good for it. Like, honestly, I would never want to fight this thing. This thing is, is diabolically strong. Um, 
I just looked it up. Uh, Hindu mythology uh, has it's the, the whole, world turtle. Yeah, world turtle. Uh, yeah, I think it's because like in all cultures, tortoises just tend to live very long. That a lot mm-hmm. of people, because it like legit tortoises will outlive people. Yeah, I have yeah. a pet tortoise. That thing is gonna be my family heirloom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. There's so also, I think. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go, 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 go. I was gonna say there's also I've read that um, people who keep like the little turtles as pets. Uh, sometimes, honestly, they forgot about them, and they go into hibernation, yeah. and then, like, years later, find them again, put them in water, and they're still alive. Freaking turtles, man. If they had thumbs and guns, they would inherit the earth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, I think it's because the whole idea, like, these turtles live so long and outlive people that they're, we associate them with wisdom, and you see that in this myth. And I think that's why, like, turtles... You, I think just universally have like the associated with wisdom or creation mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff is because of their li- long lifespan. Yeah. 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 And also one of my favorite ones are once again in pop culture is the, the spirit turtle in avatar, the last airbender basically introduced bending to uh, oh, yeah. the people of that world. Yeah. I want to say, cause like I watch a show called I'm actually all the time. And they mentioned that, I think it was either spirit turtles or lion turtles, but someone mm-hmm. gave basically gave the knowledge of bending to the world. They're I think called they called lion turtles. Lion turtles, yeah. That's what it was. Because I think I think it was a specific lion turtle whose name I cannot remember. Mm-hmm. Not Roku, that's someone else. But they basically said, like, oh hey, there's one thing you're forgetting. You could bend energy. You can bend bending. And they're like, you could do that. And he's like, yeah, didn't you listen on day seven? Yeah, we heard fire bending and left. Like that's all we want forever. And like, oh my god, humans, humans. And so that's how you learn about uh, bending, bending. Yeah. Also, to heads up for the bending. Yes, while the lion turtle gave bending, it was not the, them who taught the bending. It was all the other animals. Oh, yeah. Like uh, that's uh, right. Water bending was from the waves. Uh, fire bending was from the dragons. Uh, badger moles for the earth bending. And yeah. That's right. That's right. It's been a long time since I kept up with my lore. I think I saw like two books. I got to book. I got to Earth book, and I loved it. And then I got busy with college. And to date myself, that's old. I was when this came out, and I was like, eh, I'll watch it. It's a kid show. I'll watch it later. But uh, that I know. Yeah, like uh, we said before, these spirit turtles, honestly, as um, a GM, are great ways to use as you know, uh, quest givers, but also as mentors or, you know, mm-hmm. for your characters. Like, if you're doing, honestly, if you're doing, like, a uh, Asian-inspired world or you have a character who uh, wants to learn martial arts or whatever, having a spirit turtle as a connection would be a great way to kind of, you know, introduce a lot of stuff. Yeah, I also kind of like the fact that in, in essence, and I mean in the loosest of essences, this is the antithesis of a Tarasque. If the Tarasque is labeled as the Armageddon engine, like it is just a, it is just a, a non-thinking entity of whatever I walk into, I will destroy until I absentmindedly go to the next and destroy that. Now you have the spirit turtle who's like, I'm the, I'm the exact antithesis. I, I am the engine of creation and consistent renewal. Like, you know, you have a Tarasque show up and a spirit turtle show up. I think there's like about four or five CR difference. So maybe yeah. get like an elite spirit turtle. I'd love to kind of see that, that fight. Yeah, see who I was going to say, who will win? Spirit turtle yeah. or Tarasque? Hey, chat, let us know and uh, hit us up in uh, our Discord. That's right. If I see it in the chat, I'll jump in. I'll start putting in my two cents. Like, who'd win a fight? An elite spirit turtle or a Tarasque? Mm-hmm. Let's go. But with that being said, um, anything else, uh, Eunice, that uh, you want to drop on us before? Because I think it's around. Yeah, it is. It is time. <laughs> um, well, just, I, no joke, like, as I said at the beginning, like, I think, I really admire what they did, and I wish, like, you know, because, as, as I said, I'm Chinese, so mm-hmm. my forte is Chinese, but I would love to see, like, other, like, cultures, like, you know, the, what was it, the, the Angguyang, Angguyang, like, yeah. the, the thing, I would love to see what um, other people culture, like, think about the, their cultural animals, their mm-hmm. cultural views, because, like, for me, like, because I sing it from a Chinese perspective, like, the Anglo Yang reminded me of Tango from the thing. Mm-hmm. What was it? The, the, bu- the Bulgai? The Bulgai? 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 Bulgai. Bulgai. The Bulgai is, yeah, it's like the, um, is that, that dog that eats the sun. We have the same, uh, we have something very similar in Chinese culture as well. It's, it's also another Tango that it's, it eats, actually it's not eat the sun, it eats the moon. And that's why mm. we have lunar eclipses. That's like a whole, like, thing with the Chang'e myth, which is the moon goddess. 
but I just, I love what is done. I'm just yeah. like, I'm looking at like all of the, like the little like things, like as I said, like the 10, like the 10 days with the Sanzu. I'm just like, dude, that's like little small things that just show mm -hmm. how much thought that was actually put into this. Uh, same thing with the Jiangshi, like the uh, Fulu, like the whole Fu and that kind of stuff. And the, it's just, it just really shows how much yeah. was put into this. Yeah. It, crazy i love it yeah no this totally is... totally uh yeah. i kind of want to say um with the whole uh this one of my favorite things about these adventure paths and especially the thistle ruby phoenix in particular other than you know what it has some pretty cool you know stuff for players to use as in you know uh archetypes and some items is these monsters that are taken from um like folklore real from real life folklore but also they do take care of also mm -hmm. putting it putting their kind of their own spin on it so it fits into a ttrpg game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah like i said with the spirit turtle having yeah. that powerful magic to kind of symbolize what the turtle means for creation for the, for the longevity of creation it's kind of a fun way to be like okay okay this thing's basically a godlike turtle Mm -hmm. In mythology and in our world, how are we going to represent that with the world where magic is powerful and commonplace? Yeah. We gave it the best healing and revival spells the world's ever seen. There you mm -hmm. go. And uh, really quick, um, Eunice, uh, of the mm -hmm. ones we have gone over uh, today, is there anything that in, any creature that in particular kind of stood out to you? While researching or while going over it? <laughs> uh, just going over it through uh, our, you know, our stream today. Our stream? No joke. Um, I really like the, the idea of the Quinpong. Oh. Not just because of your ping, but... <laughs> 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 no, but I actually really like pong? idea because... Pong? 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 Like, pong yo. Pong yo. Pong? Pong? Which is funny because pong? Uh, pong actually used the same radical as pong yo, which is friend. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so um, cool. Yeah, so um, the thing is, like, um, with the Kun, like, you know, here they have, they made it evil, and they have the transformation for, like, you know, to become something. Uh, it's not, like, evil in, like, mythology, but I just, I don't know, I actually really enjoy Kung Pong. And the funny thing is, like, before, t like, doing all this, I actually did not know a lot of these. I know, like, of course, Jiang Shi, like, the Gumiho, the Spirit Turtle, those are kind of just standard, like, you know, animals that's always depicted in media. But like the Sanzu uh, Wu and the Kun Pong, those two were just like, I was like, wait, what? Like, I didn't know like those crows were called Sanzu Wu. I thought they were just crows. <laughs> but for me, I really enjoy the Kun Pong because like the whole idea of like the, it's the human potential of becoming better and that kind of stuff. So definitely these two, and of course, like the whole idea of the yin and yang, they're two sides of the same coin yeah. kind of style. Mm -hmm. It's very much, yeah. And uh, PJ, what about you? Uh, any any of the creatures that we discussed today kind of really stood out to you? Uh, well, I'm a little biased because Torterra is my favorite <laughs> starter Pokemon from, from Diamond and Pearl, so Spirit Turtle all the way. Plus, you give me a CR21 creature who could do 260 damage around and still has ninth level resurrections to throw out like candy mm -hmm. and a fourth level heal at will. Like, dude, it, it's... It's a paladin turtle. Fair, you know fair. I'm going to fall in love with a paladin yeah. turtle. Yeah. Uh, for me, it would have to be the Jiangxi. Mainly for a fact that I love, like, it wasn't, when I first uh, kind of went through it, I didn't really scroll down. I just saw the, the top part and was like, oh, it's just, you know, it's the hopping vampire. But when you scroll down on the archives, th with the information that um, Paizo provided, they went really in depth on this mm -hmm. and also i love the fact that it's not just like a human hopping vampire you could you could kind of put this uh i guess ghost type over any other creature mm -hmm. you know they have out there like i said you can make a bugbear um uh jung -shi. you can make uh Let's see, a leshy jungshi or anything like that. Honestly, a leshy jungshi, I'm just thinking now a hopping scarecrow like creature. Oh like, my god, that'd be amazing. Oh my god, like house moving castle. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. Or like Phil Sticks from League of Legends, yeah. who's like, I think some sort of evil scarecrow wizard. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. it's such a cool thing. And I love, because I also loved, uh, thank you, Eunice, for coming to the show. It's always a delight to have you. Uh, the knowledge, and not just the knowledge that you have, but the way that you teach it to us. Because you're a teacher, so you know how. It's always so exciting. Yeah. 
And I loved learning about the Jiangxi, not just the politics of it, but more about the mythology and spirituality mm -hmm. of it. And really making sense of all the, me the mechanics I was watching. I'm like, okay, breath sense. That's super dope. What is, why would that even be a thing? And you're like, because they eat from a, what? <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was great having you. And I really did love the Jiangxi. I think it was the highlight of the discussion for sure Yay. was the Jiangxi. Thank you for having me. I always have lots of fun here, so. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm not gonna make any promises, but I do know that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot more creatures in the the Fist mm. Ruby Phoenix AP, including one we're gonna have a surprise and we completely ran out of time for. Yeah. So I'm gonna leave it up to Michael. But if and when we can cover more of these things, I know speaking for mm. myself, we'd love to have you back. Have to be here again. <laughs> All uh, right. Okay. I believe it's t it's that time, and yeah, let's uh, start making our goodbyes. Uh, Eunice. Uh, yes. Uh, why don't you let our audience know where they can find you and all that good stuff? What doggo? And Hama! And where can you find Hama? You can find Hama. You can find Hama actually on Instagram at myhamachi. Um, he's all over that. But, uh, okay, let me put him down. He's really heavy. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he's a heavy boy. He eats a lot. He eats all the treats. Um, so you can find me uh, for with more information about Chinese culture. I actually do... I'm, oh my god, I'm stuck. I'm actually going to make a video about the Chinese uh, bestiary, so in the future, so be on the lookout for that. That one I'm going to be talking about a lot of different creatures and that kind of stuff, and you guys can take inspiration from. Um, so you can find me on YouTube at J Palace Yaya. Yeah, yeah. I make videos about Chinese culture, mythology, uh, traditions, weird holidays like the Dragon Boat Festival. I sometimes do cooking videos. I'm making one this week. Oh my god. <laughs> um, so yes, you can find me on YouTube at jpalace. Yeah, yeah, you can find me also, again, on Twitch at myhamachi. I stream on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where I just play random games. I have, like, Horror Game Day. I have, like, Fallout 4 and all that fun stuff. And I just talk about culture sometimes on there. Michael knows. Yeah, <laughs> But anyways, yes, and you can find me again on Instagram, either at myhamachi or jpalaziaya, Twitter at jpalaziaya. Basically anything, just either search for myhamachi or jpalaziaya, and you will sh most likely find me there. <laughs> awesome, right. boss. Awesome. Michael, why don't you tell us who you are and where we can find you on that sweet, sweet internet and anything upcoming? Well, as always, I am the dastardly dashing Michael Pal, and you can find me all over the internet on my social media, which is called at Mr. Kapow, that's M-R-K-A-P-A-O. Or my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Michael Pow does stuff. Because I do a lot of stuff, like my YouTube channel, which is called Fantastic Tales of Adventure. And on Thursdays at the Toyzilla Network channel, you can find me uh, co-hosting a show called Toyzilla Live, where we talk about toy news and all that nostalgia stuff. It's a lot of fun, and I hope to see you there. And, uh, yeah, uh, upcoming stuff. Uh, oh, this weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. I am going to be part of... Uh, okay, uh, PJ, you're going to have to help me with some of the details here because I'm just learning about it myself. But um, sure. part of PaizoCon Europe event on Saturday. Uh, we, I believe we will be starting... Pacific Standard Time at around, is it 9 or 10 a.m.? 10, 10 a.m. 10 a.m. All the way till about, I think, 4 p.m.-ish. At the latest, I believe. Around that yeah. uh, time period time. And, uh, yeah, we will be going through a uh, upcoming, um, upcoming adventure from the Pathfinder Society, I believe. And I will be taking on the role of, well, I haven't decided on a name yet, but I will be... A swashbuckler. I'll be swashing all the buckles. So yeah, that should be really fun. I hope to see you there. And what was the what was the face uh, the Twitch channel for that PJ? Uh, was it Band of Badgers? Let me get you on that. Well, actually, uh, I know Band of Badgers is doing the show, yes. which is probably is a good way to follow us. Go mm -hmm. Twitch backslash uh, Twitch TV backslash Band of Badgers. Uh, but I do know also this is participating in the Paizo con online in europe mm. so if you have the twitch for paizo uh i recommend looking that up directly we'll we'll try to get more information by wednesday night mm -hmm. uh speaking of which 
Do you mind if I? Yeah. Do you mind go if ahead. we have any more? I want to make sure I'm not stepping on your toes. I'm going to say, go ahead. It's your turn. All right. Well, my name is PJ McGall. You can find me all over the internet at PJ McGall. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Come find me. Come friend me. Let's have some fun. When I'm not here with these absolute legends on Tuesday, 3:30 to 5:30 p.m. You can also find us with other legends on Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for Edge of Legend. And if you tuned in last week, you saw the big news. Korokos has arrived, and it's the beginning of the end of the Green War, and only one side will be alive. If you want to see the episode, go to our YouTube and look up episode 56, beginning of the end. Now, other fun announcements. This weekend, uh, myself, Sam, and Michael will be participating with Band of Badgers and some of their mates over in the UK for PaizoCon Online 2021 Europe. We're going to be doing a great pre-made uh, game that Paizo wrote for this convention, for this online show, and ironically enough, Michael and I will both be swashbucklers. However, All the buckles. We're going to be swashing so many buckles. Uh, however, uh, I'll be doing the show on Friday. So, Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, I believe 1 p.m. Pacific or Eastern Standard Time. If you want to watch me swash a buckle, come and tune in Friday morning. Uh, and if you can't, Tune in Saturdays to see Michael and Sam with a bunch of awesome ba uh, Badgers and mates from the UK as they continue to play the same, uh, actually a different module, I think at level two, but similar, like, flow story. I think story. it's in the same adventure path, we're just yeah. taking different times. You're just areas. kind of like, yeah, yeah. like, we're going to end, pond. and then the day two, you're going to be doing the, the second thing. Yeah. So come and tune in and see that. My swashbuckler is named Rodolfo, because I'm a huge Capafero fan. Uh, I have no idea what his personality is going to be like. So come to this weekend to watch Edge of Legend, Nat 20 Productions, team up with Band of Badgers and Paizo to show Europe how we do what we do. Uh, and hopefully we'll have more details on Wednesday for what the stream is specifically. And until then, we love you, we adore you, and we'll see you same. We'll see you here, same Nat time, same Nat channel at the table. Be safe, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.